<laughs> one thirty, I mean, twelve thirty or so. <clears throat> Namaskar. That is what I learned in Delhi. <laughs> in German language, there are many greetings. One is the screen, Guten Morgen, Good Morning, Guten Abend, Good Evening, and another is Grüß Gott, Greet God. So I always said Grüß Gott without thinking. No use to put pressure on mind <laughs> or brain. So Namaskar. Sir, at present you are joining from Germany. No, no, no. Ah, ma'am, Sasika, Sasika. Oh, Sastika. just like that, you are saying Sasika, Sasika, Sasika. Sasika. Na ji, hum na hi mahale shift kar gaye after leave. Oh, Germany, utna galna jaad hondi nahi niya. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Bupinder this side. Handy doubt, sir. Ki hal chal? Fine. To see Germany nu yaad karke mainu bhi yaad karata hai ga. <laughs> Naturally, that's such a time. I am lucky. 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 I am Yes, yes, you also met me. At Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Under the Eiffel Tower. That Patra of Kahan, Rahe. Sir, I was in France that, that time. France? Uh, I was about uh, one and a half years there in Lyon, France. Jitney Lok, France, may I walk at the France is much better country than Germany? Yes, yes indeed. My thing. sister's son is there nowadays. He says that uh, there is a term called siasta. Mm -hmm. So everybody, he says uh, that at two, they leave their office and then, then they don't come back to the university. Uh -huh. So I said, please find a job for me also. <laughs> because here, even if you're working up to 12 night, India is still not shining. <laughs> 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 they, in fact, uh, they are disciplined people, they are duty bound. Yeah. And uh, we feel, particularly, I will talk about Punjab, not the rest of the country, maybe North East India, we can say, we feel proud in not obeying the law. <laughs> and, and there is a reason for that mm. because all aggressors came from this side. And uh, once I was having discussion about uh, Seed huh? Act, it oh, was 1978. Beautiful. Huh. There was a gentleman who was on the editorial board of serial uh, search communications from Poland. I've forgotten his name. My professor, he and I, we three were going for lunch and uh, I said that uh, we have problems with quality of seed in India. And my professor said, then, what is the problem? Have law? He said, we have law. He said, then, what is the problem? I have to keep quiet. So they follow law. One very good example which I quote when I am with the farmers, it is not that German people or French or uh, English people don't have money. They can purchase cars for their sons and daughters when they are seven or eight or nine years old. But no, not until they are 18. They will not give they, they, they will not think of having keys. And what is happening in Punjab? When the child is six, seven years old, we give the key. Okay, beta, you start driving tractor. Wonderful. Then after one or two or three years, he will not ask for the key of car. Oh, apne bhi le bar. So apna system or but still, let us be optimistic. Still, we are working and we are making progress. Pessimist nahi hona chahiye. Apne jo kya dete hain, ye paisong ki kamii hai. But we are very large human source. Right. Yes. So discussion बंद करें दो two thirty हुए तो ये two thirty two हो गया दो उजास साहब दो उजास साहब हमारी गप्पे तो खत्म नहीं होंगी कभी भी नमस्कार डॉक्टर बंसर ओके वेलकम यू ऑल आफ्टर दी रिफ्रेशिंग एंड म्यूटिंग सॉरी सॉरी दबोचा आई एम नॉट म्यूटेड मैम Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. yes, 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 audible. Yeah. yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. After the uh, lunch break, the refreshing and invigorating uh, lunch break. So before lunch, we completed seven presentations. So now we are left with the six more presentations. 
so you know, with the permission of the chair so can we start with the please, next presentation please, 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 uh, please the next presenter would be uh, mr neeraj kumar from the discipline of genetics and plant breeding respected chairman and the jury members of the session distinguished scientists and my dear friends a very good morning to all i am neeraj kumar phd student representing the discipline of genetics i welcome you all to my presentation global climate change and rapid increase in world population pose a major threat to agriculture and food production current projection says that there will be 9.1 billion mouths to be fed by 2050 the population growth of india is further disturbing sooner we will be surpassing china in few years by 2050 india needs to produce 350 million tons of food grain to sustain its population salt affected soil is a major abiotic stress that affects global agriculture worldwide more than 80 million hectares area is affected by salinity additionally every year 10% of arable land is getting salinized which is estimated the loss of about 27.3 billion us dollars by 2050 50% of arable land will be salinized various factors like unsustainable irrigation practice depleting water resources high sodium content in soil and water are causing salinity if we talk about salinity in indian perspective 12 indian state have more than 44% of salt affected soil together 6.74 million hectares of our land is salt sea grossly 5% of our net cultivated area is affected by salinity in india chickpea is an important dietary grain legume crop it is the second most important pulse crop in world after dry beans india is also the largest chickpea producer in the world with about 11.99 metric ton production last year chickpea contribute immensely to the protein diet of indian population living in arid and semi arid regions it is a resource of protein carbs fat fiber energy and some of important vitamins like vitamin b6 vitamin c and folate since chickpea is a salt sensitive legume and cannot thrive under excess salt stress its production is 8 to 10% reduced annually due to salinity salt affected soils have high amount of sodium and other toxic ions leading to osmotic nutritional ionic and hormonal imbalance which all together affects plant growth and development under stress to combat salinity there are several approaches like soil reclamation chemical amendments irrigation water management and tolerant cultivars but the development of tolerant cultivar is the most sustainable and preferred strategy to combat this stress but for the rapid development of salt tolerant chickpea cultivar first we have to understand the genomic regions regulating salt tolerance in depth understanding of molecular mechanism underlying salinity is also required robust marker systems are required to identify gene types having salinity tolerance with this background and information my thesis title was formulated as mapping genomic regions imparting salt stress tolerance in chickpea the objectives of research work was to map qtls for salinity tolerance in biparental mapping population transcriptome profiling to identify the differentially expressed genes and to identify and validate candidate gene specific markers for salinity tolerance chickpea f8 mapping population of size 232 derived from iccv10 and dcp92-3 cross was used for mapping study microplot experiment setup was used to phenotype real population for two seasons at 6 decimal per meter ec at csri karnal second setup was for physio biochemical and ion study of real population under pot experiments at iari new delhi the third setup was hydroponics experimentation for rna seq related study at 150 millimolar nacl concentration at national phytotron facility iari new delhi for mapping related study real population with parents was phenotype under control and saline environment for two consecutive seasons for 2015 16 normal frequency distribution was observed for all the trait analyzed sol stress impacted on yield and other parameters of real genotypes and parents there were more than seven fold decrease in yield of sensitive parent under stress as compared to the tolerant parent similar observation was recorded in next year 2016-17 where there was more than eight fold decrease in yield of sensitive parent 
For high density genotyping of real population, custom made Sizer Exhume Array was used for SNP genotyping, in which 50,590 SNP probes were distributed across 8 linkage groups, out of which 5,123 SNP were polymorphic and were used in mapping. 5,123 polymorphic SNPs were used to construct linkage map using Join Map version 4.1, in which 1856 markers were assigned to 8 linkage group. The integrated map has a total length of 1106.3 cm with average distance of 0.59 cm between adjacent markers. Multi-season field phenotypic data of real population and SNP genotypic data of Sizer Exeum array were correlated using Windows QTL cartographer with the composite interval mapping at lot more than 3 and p-value less than 0.05. QTL displaying more than 10% of phenotypic variance were considered as major QTLs. 9 major and 12 minor QTLs were detected for the 7 yield and yield related traits in 2 seasons. Salt susceptibility index and salt tolerant index are the two important measures for estimating the effect of salinity tolerance on yield. QTLs for these traits can be crucial for salinity tolerance. Similarly, 3 major and 4 minor QTLs were also detected for agronomic traits. These QTLs can have important role in regulating the growth and development of plant under salt stress conditions. Genomic regions on linkage group 3 and 6 have important QTLs for yield related traits. Blast analysis of flanking markers holding these major QTLs revealed that these regions harbored 113 key genes that were reportedly involved under salinity stress and abiotic stress tolerance in chickpea. Our second objective of study was to identify differentially expressed gene using transcriptome profiling. DG analysis was performed using p-value cutoff less than 0.05 and log to fold change plus minus 2. In total, 21,698 DGs were detected, out of which 11,456 were up and 10,242 were down regulated. For functional classification and gene ontology analysis, DEGs were subjected to enrichment analysis of GO terms based on molecular function, cellular component, and biological process using Agrigo web tool. These DEGs were categorized into 64 functional groups, and large fractions of these genes were involved in response to stimulus, signaling receptor, transporter activity, and integral component of membranes. We further analyzed the expression pattern of DEGs regulated under stress and control treatment across the genotype. Heat map was scaled on the basis of FPKM count. DEG showed different expression pattern in sample for stress and non-stress conditions, indicating main response of DEGs differ between sensitive and tolerant genotype. Based on their nature, they were grouped into similar group displaying different expression pattern for control and stress conditions. Further, differentially expressed transcription factors in these studies were analyzed. Total 173 different TFs were differentially regulated, 85 were upregulated and 88 were downregulated. Most regulated transcription factors were ERF, MIB, WRKY, NAC family transcription factor, which are reported in several crops to have role in salinity responsiveness. Validation of RNA-seq data was done using real-time PCR. 11 genes responding to salinity stress were selected from the panel of identified genes in RNA sequence study. Gene-specific primers were designed using Primer3 software, and the relative transcription in terms of fold change was determined. All the 11 genes followed similar trends of expression in both QRT-PCR and RNA-seq analysis. For the most of sample, the results obtained in RT-PCR studies were highly consistent with the RNA-seq data. We further investigated the commonly differentially expressed gene between both the tolerant and both the sensitive genotype. These genes played active roles in signaling, transport, transcription factor regulation, hormonal regulation, and osmoprotectant. The differential regulation of these genes explained that the tolerant genotype engage much more sophisticated machinery of gene to combat salt stress as compared to sensitive one. Our third objective was to develop the candidate gene-based markers for salinity tolerance. On the basis of gene identified in QTL region and their relative fold change in RNA-seq data, we shortlisted 228 genes which were screened for SR using CRAD tool. We identified total 158 SR motif, mostly mono, di, followed by tri, tetra, penta, and hexa. The repeat motif AT and AG were in high abundance. For the validation of these candidate gene-based SR marker, 20 SR primers were selected and were amplified on the chickpea population having 24 genotype of variable response towards salinity.
on the basis of result of CGSR markers, the genetic diversity and structure analysis was performed, in which we could easily distinguish between tolerant and sensitive genotype on the basis of amplification pattern obtained by these CGSR markers. We can see the two major clusters of tolerant and sensitive genotype, and the genetic structure also depicts the presence of two gene pools. These are some findings of our study. This pool identifies 28 UPL explaining group 28.40 phenotypic. In this group 3 and 6 were the major hub for QTLs. Upregulation of transcripts, including potassium transporters, transcription factors, and genes were found in our study. Tolerant genotype uses more efficient machinery to beat the SAR stress. The candidate gene base SR could be the reliable tool to distinguish tolerant and sensitive genotype. We have came out with some good publication from this study. One of our paper is published in Environmental and Experimental Botany with NAS rating of 11.55. The second paper is published in International Journal of Molecular Sciences with NAS rating of 10.54. The third paper is published recently in Physiology and Molecular Biology of Plants with NAS rating of 8.39. Two other papers published in Indian Journal of Agriculture Sciences with NAS rating of 6.37 and in Indian Journal of Genetics and Plant Breeding with NAS rating of 6.55. We have also documented and submitted 8 SRA genomic sequences to NCBI. I participated in Indo-US bilateral workshop on genomic approaches for yield enhancement and biological nitrogen fixation in chickpea held at IARI New Delhi. I also presented my research work in various national and international conferences. Further, I was awarded with the best student award in 5th National Convention of Agrivision by Honorable Union Minister of Agriculture. As a future work path ahead, metabolome and fluxomics can be added in study. Sodium sensing and perception mechanism can be delineated. Targeted mutagenesis for making chickpea sodium insensitive can be tried. I sincerely acknowledge the effort of my advisory committee member. I am thankful to Division of Genetics IARI New Delhi, PG School IARI New Delhi and my family and friends. I would like to first invite Dr. Bansal uh, for interaction with the student. Um, okay, Mr. Neeraj Kumar, um, you presented a comprehensive analysis of uh, Celentis's tolerance in chickpea. And um, you have used two different approaches. But before I come to those approaches which you have utilized to identify finally the gene-based markers, you know, and um, several other genes you have identified. But before that, you mentioned that um, you know, there are 12 states and one union territory in Indian map you showed, which are affected by salt. Uh, where are you? I can, I would like to see you. Yeah, you are here. So you mentioned two states and one union territory are affected by salt. So yes. your, work, your work, was it targeted to a particular state or a target environment, which is mostly affected by salinity for chickpea production? That's one question. The second, to what level of soil salinity, you, you know, your plants, you treated them before you isolated, you did all those analysis, you talked about sensitive versus resistant, you did a mapping population. And on the second approach, you did transcriptomic analysis, which is fine, you know, which is a very good approach, two different approaches altogether you used. So did you, um, you know, first of all, identify particularly in the genotypes you took as sensitive and, uh, and uh, resistant, what was the mechanism of action, you know, which was making either one sensitive or the other one tolerant, you know, so that you could then lay hands finally, you know, if you could identify genes, whether they go back and, and you know, incorporate that kind of resistance using the particular mechanism, which is already known at the physiological level, not necessarily you know, at the, at the genetic or at the molecular level. So before I go into further questions, can I have some response from you on these two aspects? Please? Yes, sir. Thank you for your question, sir. Uh, first question was uh, whether the study was focused to a particular target environment. I would like to inform you that we uh, didn't uh, focus on particular target environment. We did our phenotyping study at CSRI Karnal for the two seasons. So uh, the uh, mapping regions which we have identified in our population can be used to develop chickpea cultivars. After that, it can be uh, 
after integration of the those QTLs in elite cultivars, it can be released to after uh, acrid trials to a suitable target environment. We didn't. Okay. Know. So I, what I thought was that you would have identified a target environment so that you, you know identify you know after you have exposed your your genotypes you know to to that target environment because the mechanism of action will vary. You know even so, if you go in Karnal and you go into another target environment, things will be all different. You know, with regard to you know soil salinity, and also what level of soil salinity in any of the target environments, for example, you have in mind that these plants should be able to resist. What level of soil salinity? So for screening or mapping population, we used uh, six decisimen per meter. It is equivalent to 60 millimolar concentration of NaCl, which we use for the screening of our mapping population. So you think? Um, when you talk of salt affected areas, yes, is that level which is really affecting the chickpea production in major production areas? Major production area, in a, if we talk about northern India, most of the chickpea cultivation is now shifting to the southern states of India due to increase in salinity. So most of the area in Uttar, Western UP and Haryana and Punjab, they are salt sick and they are not uh, uh, we are not getting an optimized yield of chickpea in these areas. Now, do we have information on what level of salinity is there in different parts of this country where chickpea is at the moment grown? Where yes, is so we, do, we don't have uh, uh, such information in with perspective to chickpea. No, it must be there. I'm sure it must be there with salinity, soil salinity research institute. But anyway, then coming down to your approach one, that is mapping population, you know, drive rails you used. And you came out with 113 putative genes, right? Yes, sir. Right. And in the second approach, using transcriptomics analysis, you found some differentially expressed genes, and you went down to identification of 173, you know, genes encoding transcription factors, right? Yes, sir. So any any relationship between these two approaches that you found some genes which were all entirely different or similar? Yes, sir. Know, yes, sir. There was a relationship. Uh, did you do that comparative analysis? Because I didn't hear in your presentation. Yeah, yeah, comparative analysis was done. Uh, uh, the comparative expression analysis between the genotypes and between the treatments were also done. Or also, no, no, we no, have. Please listen to Mr. Nirkumar. Specific question I've asked you. In, right? in respect to QTL and transcriptome analysis, you are asking whether. I'm asking 130 genes you identified yes. using mapping population approach and 173 transcription factor encoding genes you identified using transcriptomic approach, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Did you do any comparative analysis between these two sets of genes, which I did not see in your presentation? Uh, the uh, genes which we identified in QTL regions, we have uh, uh, also analyzed those gene regions in our transcriptome data. So the fold change in the transcriptome data and the genes which were there in QTL regions were selected to make the candidate gene specific primer. So the study was correlated. No, but you didn't send that data. Hear that. Nearest, the question Dr. Bansal is asking is that how many of the transcription factor genes that you identified, they were co-localized in the regions of QTLs. Right. That's a very specific question. How many of them they were co-localized in the QTL regions? Yes, sir. So, uh, just a second, sir. Out of 113 genes, which we have uh, found uh, in uh, QTL regions, and the genes which were analyzed using transcriptome data. Right. You see, in QTL region, you cannot find gene. Unless right. The point is yes. that QTL region is a genomic region. You can see marker trait association. No, sir. In QTL region, we uh, blast analysis those region, the flanking marker regions with chickpea reference genome. There we found 113 genes. And the genes which we got in uh, our expression analysis, transcriptome analysis. So on the basis of the common genes which were upregulating and downregulating, we design our candidate gene based SR farmers markers. So the uh, there is an association with the relative fold change. Exact number I uh, I will 
Okay, so okay, keeping time in view, I think we have to move on. Uh, and second, uh, I would like to finally ask you, you know, that what sort of mechanism you're looking for, in fact, incorporating through either SSR-based markers or through transgenic approach or through genome editing approach, you know, you want to incorporate in any particular resistant chickpea genotype which will be better than already resistant chickpea you have used in your mapping population. What kind of a new mechanism you thought, you know, these genes will be, will be. So, uh, basically the sodium transport mechanism is crucial to uh, give tolerant to any chickpea genotype. So no, that, that's be... a general question. That's a general answer you're talking about. Yes, yeah. Talking about a specific mechanism. Sodium transport and signaling. If the chickpea genotype is make, insensitive toward the signaling of sodium, then it would be uh, automatically somewhat tolerant to the salinity stress. So did you find any genes related to this particular aspect in your study? Uh, sir, we didn't find that, but we find the CDPK no, genes. No, Mr. Which... So what I'm saying, Mr. Nira, is you could have done all that analysis actually to, to make your study complete. I was wondering that you will go further. I can understand time must be a factor, but abruptly you, you came to a close. Uh, and uh, I thought you would have given some analysis of this kind as well when you've gone to the level of genes or even, you know, using different approaches. So I think that's something very important, you know, um, to, to further carry forward such studies. At a PhD level, I'm expecting even more. Thank you at this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So may I now invite uh, Dr. Patra for the interaction? Thank you. Uh... Dr. Niraj Kumar, uh, excellent presentation you have made and very important subject uh, when, you know, the, uh, we are, you address the problem soils, that is the uh, saline soil um, as per your topic, saline soil. And in the country, about 6.74 million hectares and a lot of economic uh, implications is there because of the uh, current status and there is a also a prediction of increasing uh, because of the the way we are uh, uh, um, doing our agriculture. So in this uh, very important and interesting topic, uh, uh, but what I was thinking, you know, whenever any, any problem soils and we talk about the management, you know, it is an integrated approach. It is, it is, it is an integrated approach and I'm sure in your committee, advisory committee, there must have been soil scientists as well. Uh, and also you have seen the work, what Central Soil Sanitary Research Institute, there are also different kinds of varieties they have developed. And also I think there is also chickpea variety also there. Uh, uh, chickpea, the kernel China one, what I was yes, uh, doing, they also developed that also all those things might have gone. But what you are talking about the saline soils and particularly sodium, but you know, the, when we talk this saline, there are two main saline and sodic soils and also saline sodic soils, three different but mainly we talk saline soil and sodic soils. And in the, if you see the areas of about, you know, 56% or so the sodic soils and around 44% are the saline soils and they're having the distinct characteristics and particularly when the sodium you talk, when it is more in the exchangeable sites of the clay particles, when it is more than 15% exchangeable sodium percentage, percentage ESP, when more than then it is, uh, you know, qualifying the sodic soils. But the saline soil, the sulfate and chloride, the concentration of sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, the soluble salts, more than four at assignments per meter, then it is saline soils. Now you are focusing only the sodium. Now the sodium in the saline soil, you know, may not be that much, you know, than the other uh, the components. So that is uh, uh, the, uh, the things and um, I, I I feel that uh, the collaborative uh, 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 work uh, involving the not the if, since it is a PhD uh, at least the involvement of the soil scientists and other um, you know, plant physiologists and all uh, would have been <clears throat> you know necessary for uh, such kind of uh, problem addressing. Uh, so my. Um, only concern is that um, chickpea you are addressing and your the concentration of salinity you are telling around six uh, 
and this is Simon Parmeter, isn't it? Six. Yes. So, so uh, in that kind of, uh, you are not going only for the chickpea. Uh, maybe previously some other crop will be grown. So you need, you know, uh, a type of uh, crop rotations. So that aspect also, uh, not only stand alone chickpea, uh, we are going to grow. So that also uh, need to be addressed. And uh, why you taken the six um, level of the uh, salt concentrations? Uh, why not lower or higher? These are simple queries from you. Yes, sir. Uh, the six decision was taken as it is optimum level of salinity. Uh, the chickpea genotypes, we have to phenotype them. No, no. What, what, the... do you, what do you mean by optimum? Is it the most prevalent? Is it the most prevalent one? No, sir. It is more. It is more than four salinity. More than four. You see, the so soil or uh, water is called saline soil. But uh, in our condition, we have to phenotype those real population till the yield and reproductive stage. So to get yield and harvest, we have taken it as six days seven. We have earlier screened our uh, mapping population in pots and hydroponics in eight or more than eight eight DC semen per meter, but there was uh, in some real population were showing significant uh, decrease. They they do not flower as well. So we have taken this somewhat uh, less concentration of uh, salinity, which was around six DC semen, so that we can get up to the yield. And in this soil, is it the dominant sodium in the soluble, in the soluble part? Was it the dominant? How much it was? The sodium you are talking. I don't know, sir, that sodium, but we have we maintain the uh, salinity level by irrigating the micro plots with the six dc semen irrigation water by making salt concentration. Why, why did you do this experiment? CS Rai Karnas. Okay. But they must be having, you know, this line patch. Yes, sir, they have micro plots which they drain and then they build up the salinity. By irrigating those micro plot, and then we planted our chickpea crop in that. Okay, so please, um, what about the so so from the salinity institute you have the scientist in your yes sir yes sir. Dr. Joginder Singh was there from the CS Rai Karna. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. thank you, sir. May now we have the questions from Dr. Ravindra Kaur, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Dahuja. Uh, Neeraj, excellent uh, work and a very good presentation, but uh, it has triggered several queries, several questions, basically in my mind, as per the methodology part is concerned. Yeah, just now, uh, you know, you told Dr. Patra that uh, you did your experiments in CSSRE fields, and uh, they were, which were irrigated by soil uh, irrigation water of six decimals. Right? And so you assumed that the soil's salinity is six decimals. But Neeraj, it doesn't happen like that. If you irrigate any field or any soil with say irrigation water of six decimals per meter, it will immediately in the first year itself will not attain soil salinity of six decimals per meter. And in a crop like chickpea, which uh, requires very little irrigation as compared to a crop like paddy, it will take several many years to achieve that six decimals soil salinity with an irrigation water of six decimals per meter. So conceptually, methodologically, there is a flaw. So you cannot say soil salinity of six, it would be many times lower than six. Uh, and you know, will uh, be proposing this variety can be grown in a soil which is saline, having, no, having actually, a salinity. Uh, yeah. I have no, I have not uh, developed any variety. And yeah. actually, ultimately, the, uh, ultimately the, the aim is that you no? clear mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the irrigation which we did, which we did, uh, by making the soil samples and uh, by determining their EC, and we used to check at regular interval the EC buildup of the micro plots. And if EC was somewhat less, then we used to irrigate it with saline water again. So we, we used to check the EC at regular interval. And we so have it was field, field study or pot? My micro plots. 
microplots. And so what was the soil depth from where you used to take samples? We used to take samples from uh, 0 to 20 centimeters depth. Ma'am. And how much For irrigation analyzing... were you giving? We per irrigation, how much amount? Depth, depth uh, of irrigation. We used to saturate the soil uh, microplots with the saline soil. Oh, you 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 were saturating the soil uh, microplots with six decimals per meter, and then wait for a day, two or three days before you used to take sample. Uh, yes, ma'am. Or immediately after irrigation, you used to take. No, ma'am. After some time, we used to take sample. What is that time? That is what after, after irrigating the soil moisture was to. Uh, after saturating the soil, we used to hmm. wait for one, one, one week to take one this week. soil sample. Yes. So it cannot be six decimals, Neeraj, even with that one irrigation of six decimals per meter. Please recheck. It cannot be there. Okay, so that is number one. Secondly, when Dr. Patra asked you what was the purpose of setting six decimals per meter as the um, criteria, you said soils with salinity more than four are called saline. That is a, that has no meaning to it because you are talking about the crop and you are trying to identify a salt tolerant crop. So my question is, what is the soil uh, salinity tolerance level of the chickpea crop in general? Not any particular. Um, chickpea variety. can tolerate uh, soil salinity up to eight decimal per meter. Up the tolerant cultivars can give yield up to eight decimal per meter, but we have real. Population. But normal, normal, but normal, normally range. Tell me the range. Normally, it normal. varies from two point five decimal per meter ha. to eight decimal per meter. It depends so, on genotype. Right. And, uh, that's what I, I said think, in the beginning. Uh, Doctor Kaur, yeah. uh, I think <laughs> the session is prolonging. Uh, yes, yes. Long. I will close uh, here. I will close here. Uh, you see, the point is that there are some uh, SOP which has been developed by Central Soil Sanitary Research Institute in yes. the microplot screening for chickpea and those standard SOP he has followed. He may not be able to tell detail because it was done in a kind of you know collaborative work with this specialized scientist from the Central Soil Sanitary Research Institute. Sure, sure. I understand. I think he can get uh, in discussion with you on clarifying. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, would you like to ask any other question? Uh, Dr. Uh, sir? Uh. Well, now it's, uh, <laughs> it's already too long. My only uh, one question was that when, when we were discussing about the uh, mapping experiment, probably there are three approaches which pro uh, could were used, which probably you didn't uh, specify that way. One is that you have done a QTL mapping. Second, based on the genome sequence information in the QTL region, you have tried to identify some uh, genes which could confer salinity tolerance. And thirdly, you have gone for the transcriptomic approach. So all these three you put together and if you can develop some markers and then validate those markers in a mapping population, in a tolerant and susceptible genotypes to make it use, uh, usable for the breeding purpose. And what are those, uh, you know, two, three, four, because 100 is a big number. So, and what total phenotypic variance these major markers that you identify explain could be useful from the breeding perspective. So if you could briefly say, if you have identified based on all three put together, two, three uh, genomic regions are uh, genes, which could be explaining, uh, you see 10%, 20% of the total phenotypic variance and could be useful in the breeding program. Yes, sir. We have identified a uh, region of linkage group six, which was uh, 0 0.1 MB span, and he, which has the most of the QTLs, which was confirming up to 28.4% of phenotypic variance. Good. And Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So if there are no more questions from the other expert members, so I would request Chairperson Sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Neeraj, very good presentation, very good work. And you again, like uh, Dr. Rene, will be very good teacher. Speed was just uh, wonderful speed, which a student can pick up. I don't know what you are doing now. If you are at IRA, 
I request the authorities to involve you more in teaching. Very good presentation, very good description. Now I was enjoying the discussion and uh, I would like to throw some information from the practical angle. First of all, CSSRI, other colleagues must have also, there is inherently saline soil. If the level of salinity is to be increased, then uh, this irrigation extra is needed. Then not necessarily, I think, uh, Neeraj, you please explain, was only uh, chickpea grown in that plot? Yes, sir. That, My... in, in, in other season? Uh, in Rabi season, it must, be, it must be rice. No, sir, no rice was there in that. O only, only chickpea. In Rabi season, chickpea was grown. In other Kharif season, Kharif season. In Kharif season, I. Uh, no, I, I don't think any uh, such institution in North India has so much land that there will be only one crop grown in that. Then uh, that institute has come up very good. Uh, uh, we have very good experience as vice chancellor. We brought some germplasm from there. We had a dish and good level of salinity there. Number one. Number two, I, I like the discussion. We should be as perfect as possible. But there is a physical balance. There has to be compromise between sensitivity and stability. When you are going to Evaluate large number of germplasm. How many reels do you had? I don't know. 200 something? 232. 232. Then the experiment cannot be conducted under such controlled condition under which other people can conduct. The plant breeding or genetrix people cannot conduct. Dr. Ekasin, you may say SOP, etc., etc. What my personal experience is, we have to have give and take and uh, that way. But at the same time, population of environment which is important. The, the discussion started uh, with Dr. Bansal from that point. At least in Haryana, how much HP is grown under saline conditions? How much area? I know about Punjab. It is only five, five, seven, six thousand hectare. In between five to ten thousand. It was eight lakhs in 1960. And all has been replaced by wheat. No other crop. So, is there a sizable area in uh, under chickpea in Haryana, which is grown under uh, saline conditions? Oh, I have no idea, sir, about that. But no uh, idea. A anyway, no problem. I appreciate you went up to Karnal. Yes, Many people have done experiment only in uh, ports at IRA. Yes, I, I know. I will not uh, name. Dr. Ekasim, you can ask him when he was head of department. I used to visit regularly Division of Genetics and see the ports, etc. So that way, but population of an environment which is under focus should... You see, there are two changes. Uh, sorry, uh, gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen, I'm taking more time. Two changes which I feel very good in plant breeding. At our time, it was combined immediately it was genetic analysis, it is this and that, contrary to genetics. Nobody wants to talk about breeding because breeding, it takes time. With biotechnology, number one, publications are good, and number two, you are, we are also now focusing more on breeding. Identifying QTL, identifying marker, identifying this transcriptome, etc., etc. So, whatever we did as MSCBD student, they were not directly of much help to plant breeders. Let me be very, very, very frank. It was dominated by quantitative genetics. Now, whatever many students are doing, so that way. But at least you should know that. In fact, that was the first question I have written. That how much area under chickpea is under saline conditions at national level. And then you should know at least uh, which state there is more saline area under chickpea cultivation. But anyway, uh, we don't know all the things, but that 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 uh, is one expected question, and we should be as precise as possible. But I will say openly 228 or something, whatever you said then you cannot maintain all those things uh, all the time. Now, you gave a statement, 28 genes and 28.4% variation explained. 
So how many were, was there any major QTL also? Yeah. Or, uh, yes, sir. The, 20, the 28 is the total uh, number of QTLs which we find there. Yeah. And, and the one of the QTL, which was major QTL on linkage group 6, it was explaining up to 28.4% of variation. One, one QTL? Yeah, yes, sir. Then you should write 1 plus 27. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> <laughs> then I will not put all quotas and quotas proper. I mean, quotas and quotas. One QTL, 28%. Uh, I will say that is a super QTL. Anyway, uh, were there any other institutions also involved in the study? CSRI, yes, Karnal, and uh, IERA? Yes, sir. ICRISAT and IAPR were also involved in this. So that was the reason that you went to uh, work on uh, GRAM, chickpea. Yes, sir. So th this answers the question because it has network. And, and that, that's not bad. Again, we want to expose our student to international networks or international institutes so that you do good work and uh, you, you get some good job also. We feel proud that most of the, I think, Indians have, are in largest number who have got World Food Prize. Maybe someone can correct me. I don't know exactly. I'm not compared with others, but we are there are nine Indians probably out of 20, 30, 30 degree. Away. So, what are you doing now? Sir, I'm uh, working as a scientist in Indian Grassland for the Research Institute. Oh, so you have gone away, but I will come back. Suppose you are recruited at IRI in Chickpea. I don't know what is the designation, geneticist or plant breeder. You listed three points at the end. Yes, sir. They were we should work further. Will you stick to those three words, uh, three uh, points, three issues, or you will change them or add something or delete something? Suppose you are in Czech P. Dr. Ekasing, what is the designation at PEU? It is a Czech P breeder. What is the designation of work, persons working at IRE? Czech P geneticist or Czech P breeder? What is ICR? Scientist, senior scientist, principal scientist. Scientist. Within bracket, some crop is there or no crop? Doctor A.K. Singh. I think what you say in another meeting. Sir, is in another meeting. Okay, okay. okay. No, 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 I am not in another meeting. I am in this meeting only. What I am saying is that uh, the, we are only identified as scientists, senior scientists, principal scientists, and uh, it is uh, in a project mode. So you, there is a chick project, all the people working in Chikpi, they will be in Chikpi. So th there's but nothing in bracket. Write, we don't write nothing in bracket. Nothing in bracket. At PAU, they wanted to follow this. I didn't agree. So I, I feel proud to be Ms. Breeder. Mm -hmm. any, mm -hmm. any, anyway, let us say that you are in P, uh, Chikpi group. Yes, sir. You are principal scientist or scientist or whatever the designation is. Will you like to add something, change those three, uh, the, you have mentioned three, what should I say, way ahead? Or... Uh, the three will be on my main focus, sir. Apart from that, I will be also introducing those, these identified QTL. In yeah, the yeah, yeah, that is what I said, that with this background, now you should say that identifying marker and introducing. Yes, sir. We have publication to Jay, but I don't know about ICR, but Badal Sako map publication is up. So, PG Nichila Sakata. Anyway, it is player and it, it, it is learning experience with uh, discussion. Every colleague who has given some input, he has tried to help you in better redoing if you have to again do the experiment or some other student is trying to do working on salinity or related issue. All situations which have come are important, very relevant, and at least I personally feel very much thankful to all the colleagues who gave. There was a very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your comments. So now we can move on to the uh, next presentation, which is by Mr. Kishore Tribhuvan uh, from Discipline of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. <clears throat> Honorable dignitaries on the dais, jury members, respected teachers, and my dear friends, I welcome you all to my presentation. As we know, India is the second most populated country in the world. The surge of the population has been drastic during the last few decades. 
and till the end of 2020 our country was one of the most increasing population in the world thanks to indian agriculture research system for developing high yielding crop varieties and modern agriculture tools and practices we significantly increased the production and productivity of the crops as a result we are able to produce enough food grain to feed our populations now having achieved a self sufficiency in food grain production it is high time to look into the nutritional value of the food a significant population in india specifically women and children face the health related issues like malnutrition and anemia according to who and world bank estimates one third of the indian population is malnourished according to anjas data a nobel prize winner in economics india's primary cause of malnutrition is protein deficient diet pigeon pea is a popular first crop globally india is the largest producer of pigeon pea contributing around 74 74.8% of the global production still we import more than 95% of the total global of pigeon pea to meet our domestic demand sensitivity to biotic and abiotic stresses and most importantly strong photoperiod sensitivity are the critical constraint limiting the country's productivity pigeon pea is a short day plant required less than 12 hours of photo period for induction of flowering it is a photo period sensitive uh, it's a photo period sensitive nature delays the commencement of the reproductive phase it limits the pigeon pea cultivation to specific geographical location for a single season of the year hence developing a photo period insensitive cultivar is a critical to expanding the area and multi season cultivation of the crop with this background i designed my phd work to understand the molecular mechanism of flowering in response to photo period in pigeon pea with following objectives to identify the genes genomic variations involved in the photo period insensitivity in pigeon pea characterization of the identified genes sfps indels using the diverse germ plasm for their association with photoperiod insensitivity to accomplish the objective i adopted the following methodology screening of photoperiod insensitive genotypes at extended photoperiod condition in a growth chamber resequencing of photoperiod sensitive and insensitive genotypes identification of genomic variation between sensitive and insensitive genotypes annotation of genomic variation and functional effect prediction to achieve the same objective a set of 12 geno 12 pigeon pea genotypes were grown in two different growth chambers at national phytotron facility one growth chamber was maintained at long day 16 hour photo period while another at the short day 11.5 hours photo period the experiment was conducted for two consecutive years among the 12 genotype the induction of flowering under both the long day and short day condition was observed in only three genotypes namely icp20338 icp14952 and icp14923 the remaining genotype flowered only under the short day condition this is a representative photograph of icp20338 and madri grown under long day condition icp20338 flower after 55 days while my3 did not flower the conclusion of this experiment was icp20338 icp14952 and icp14923 are photoperiod insensitive genotype while the other genotypes including my3 was photoperiod sensitive from among the three photoperiod insensitive genotype i selected icp20338 and from among the photoperiod sensitive genotype i chose mal3 for resequencing and generated a total 57 million and 71 million illumina raw reads from icp20338 and mal3 respectively 
The raw reads were further processed and used in Yankee pipeline for analysis of genomic variants. A total 1.3 million SNPs and 0.24 million indents were identified between the genomic sequence of ICP-20338 and MAL-3. The average density of SNPs and indents was 22.47 and 4.27 per 10 kb respectively. The chromosome-wide distribution of the genomic variation indicated that the chromosome 5 harbors the minimum number of the variants while the chromosome 11 harbors the maximum number of variants. Nucleotide substitution statistics suggest that the transition is more common between the genome than transversion. Annotation of variants was carried out using SNP EFF software and ensemble database. Annotation results suggest that a total of 3.1 lakhs of variants were present in 75,905 genes. So, plus analysis, I narrowed down 75,905 coding and non coding genes to 37,629 protein coding genes. These genes were mapped on 391 cake pathways. We selected the planned circuit rhythm pathway among the cake pathways for further analysis. It was found that a total 21 genes of, of circadian rhythm pathway possesses SNPs and indels, either in the promoter region or in the intronic part of the gene. Accordingly, I selected all the 21 genes for QRT-PCR based expression analysis using RNA harvested from reproductive use of short day and long day grown ICP-20338 and MAL-3. The five genes, namely Gigantia, Cryptochrome 1, Cryptochrome 2, FKF1, LHY showed upregulate expression and two genes namely Chalcon synthase and pseudo response regulator 5 showed down regulated expression in ICP-20338 as compared to MAL-3. These are the probable candidate genes for photoperiod insensitivity in pigeon. To know the role of the, these genes and further understand, further understand the molecular mechanism of photoperiod dependent flowering in pigeon feed, I explored the photoperiod pathway in modern plant through available literature. It was found that these genes work in cascade and mediate the environmental signal and flowering induction. Flowering is majorly controlled by cloisian molecule, which is the product of the flowering locus T, synthesized in reproductive leaves. Another key regulator is the constants, a transcription factor for flowering locus T. It coordinates with the environmental stimulus to activate the expression of flowering locus T. I carried out the genome-wide survey of these two family proteins to identify the constant and the FT genes responsible for flowering in pigeon pea. It was found that 13 FT family genes were present in the, in the pigeon pea genome. We checked the expression of these genes across the 32 tissues of pigeon pea using gene expression atlas data. It was found that among the 30 FT family genes, only FT8 and FT6 were expressed in the reproductive leaf tissue and may be the candidate FTs for pigeon pea. Similarly, 33 CCT family genes were present in the pigeon pea genome. Based on the presence of the protein, uh, protein domain other than CCT, these proteins were classified into the four classes. Among these four classes, only cold type CCT has both B box and CCT domain, which is a key feature of the constant gene. I carried out expression analysis between reproductive and vegetative leaf using the gene expression atlas data to find the probable constant genes in pigeon. Eight genes showed upregulated expression in reproductive leaf tissue, out of which only CCT4, CCT23, CCT31, CCT33 were cold type and may be the probable constant genes in pigeon. I carried out 
QRT-PCR plus expression analysis of candidate FP and CCT genes using RNA isolated from reproductive leaf tissues isolated from ICP-20338 and Mark J grown under short day and long day condition. The experiment revealed that in MAL3, photopeter sensitive genotype FT6 and CCT23 were upregulated under short day condition. In ICP20338, photopeter insensitive genotype both FT genes FT6 and FT8 and both CCT genes CCT4 and CCT23 were upregulated under short day condition. While under LD condition, only FT8 and CCT4 were upregulated. In MAL3, photopeter dependent flowering pathway comprising of FT6 and CCT24, CCT23 were active under short day condition. In ICP20338, both photoperiod dependent pathway comprising of FT6 and CCT23 and photoperiod independent pathway comprising of CCT4 and CCT8 were active under short day conditions. While under long day condition, only photoperiod independent pathway comprising of CCT4 and CCT8 were active and responsible for the induction of flowering under long day condition. The silent finding of my research is identified the photopeliate insensitive genotypes, namely ICP20338, ICP14952, and ICP14923 in pigeon pea. Identified seven candidate genes for photopeliate insensitivity in pigeon pea. A photopeliate ins sensitive genotypes, MAL3, flower only under the short day condition with the involvement of CCT23 as a constant and FT6 as a florigen producer gene. Photoperiod insensitive genotype ICP20338 has an additional photoperiod dependent pathway comprising of CCT4 as a constant and FT8 as a florigen producer gene which is responsible for flowering under long day condition. The part ahead of my research work is the identified photoperiod insensitive genotype may be used in the breeding program to treat the photoperiod insensitive cultivars. There is a need to develop the mapping population to map the genes responsible for photoperiod insensitivity and need a functionally a functional validation of the candidate genes to transgenic approaches. These are the my publications. I wrote my I wrote a, one book chapters. I attended one training program on flow cytometry during my PhD. I acknowledge Dr. Kishore Gaikwad, chairman of my advisory committee. I also acknowledge advisory committee members, teachers, technical staff, RA, SRM, and student. In charge National Phytotron Facility, Director ICR NIPB, Director ICR IRI for providing the platform for research, Director ICR IAB Ranchi <coughs> for providing the study loop to complete my PhD. Thank you. Can I first invite Dr. Bansal uh, for questions or queries? Okay, thank you, Mr. Kishore, for a good presentation. And you are also with Dr. Kishore. Right. Um, okay, what were your minor subjects, Dr. Kishore Kishore? Uh, sir, biochemistry. Minor. Do uh, na? Sir, biochemistry and uh, uh, genetics, sir. So you did not study plant physiology? No, sir. <laughs> so did you consult any plant physiologists before you went on to identifying your phytoinsensitive? Genotypes in pigeon P. Uh, sir, pigeon uh, P uh, genotype is uh, identified uh, based on the uh, means uh, literature. We set up the uh, this environmental condition in uh, phytotron facility, sir. So you identified photo insensitivity based on flowering only. Yes, sir. So you did not go to the potting. 
Yes, sir. Based on the initiation of flowering, sir, under the uh, extended extended photo period. My question is, you did not observe and went up to podding to see the behavior of podding also of you know these different genotypes under photosensitive and insensitive or under short. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We 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 uh, we go go up to podding, sir. But you didn't mention about it in your presentation, or did I miss it? You mentioned up to up to with regard to flowering, right? Yes, sir. So you think podding? Did you study in those three genotypes which you identified photo insensitive? Yes, sir. What podding behavior? Sir, uh, uh, actually, sir, uh, uh, first difference is that uh, uh, means the uh, they are set set for in uh, normal in both the condition, in uh, uh, normal short day condition as well as in uh, put, uh, long day condition. Means there is a uh, in, once uh, after initiation of flowering. The podding wear is normal as like short day and long day conditions. Sir. My question is, my dear friend, whether those three genotypes are identified but also photo insensitive with regard to podding or not? Yes, sir. It is uh, it is a photo photo period insensitive, sir, regarding podding also. Okay. Anyway, I mean it's not very clear. I think uh, maybe I missed that point in your presentation. And uh, next question is as well because you selected, I can understand one trait at a time, photo insensitivity is important, but how about you related with temperature? So, did you control temperature when you were giving the short day lens and day or long days? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The uh, uh, com com uh, temp temperature is uh, uh, in ramp, there is a uh, from 20 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius, sir. Is there any relationship? the temperature sensitivity or thermo insensitivity and, and uh, photo insensitivity? Is there any relationship between the two? Yes, sir. There is a uh, relationship, sir. Uh, if high, high, higher, temp higher temperature is there, then the uh, photo period insensitivity is mis break the photo period insensitivity. And uh, for the... Uh, Did you test your genotypes under high temperatures? No, sir. Not. So uh, how do you... How do you ensure that they will ever remain photo insensitive? What you identified under different temperature regimes as well? Actually, sir, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we set uh, we set uh, we set the temperature as a means uh, uh, we set the temperature as a constant factor and uh, uh, photo period we change only the photo periodic condition. Anyway, I would uh, in fact as as a, as a member of the jury, I would request and have some comments from Dr. Vishnathan from the Division of Plant Physiology, if I'm permitted to invite his comments to really see whether the methodology will review, because this is something, you know, molecular biology, no questions. NIPB is an excellent institution. Dr. Kishore is very well known. You would have done all that analysis, but important is your starting material, your itself, whether the proper, you know, 11.5, with my knowledge, I, I do not know you would have selected, you said from the literature, you know, 11.5 hours of your, you know, day length, you call it a short day, and, and 16, of course, is well defined as, as a long day. So, yeah. Dr. Vishnathan, can you please, you know, join the discussion and take the further, you know, points of clarification in this regard? So with regard to the method utilized for identification of photo insensitive versus thermal sensitivity. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, sir may I, uh, sir, in uh, many literature, means the uh, uh, even uh, in uh, uh, some literature is available in pgnp and uh, they are doing the same setup experiment for identification of this photo period sensitive genotype like in usa one uh, uh, one lab lab is working on photo period also and they also conducted the same experiment under the extended extended uh, light condition uh, keeping the 11.5 hours for uh, a short day and 16 hours for the long day conditions did you have a and treatment with continuous light with 24 hours light did you have any condition or treatment like that uh, uh, sir uh, uh, light uh, it is a uh, uh, automatically control and uh, only uh, uh, it's a 16 uh, 16 hour light after that uh, uh, 8 hours uh, dark sir Anyway, I was asking a question whether there was a continuous light also as one of the treatments. No, 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 sir. It we, was not. We are, we are not providing the continuous lights. So what do you think? Anyway, we can have a discussion with Dr. Vishnathan even now, later, if you want to say something right now. Just, because uh, this is something. 
Yeah, thank you, sir. Just I, I, I think uh, the idea was to uh, identify uh, the plants that are uh, to, uh, like photo insensitive. Uh, I, I think this uh, to uh, separate between the qualitatively if they are uh, photo insensitive, then uh, to identify uh, the allelic variation in the uh, known uh, genes that are involved in the uh, uh, regulation of uh, photo period mediated flowering and then use Gen those genes. I have no problem, Dr. Krishnan. Genes, I am not questioning. I am further seeking clarification. Yes, sir. To because I think there are no photo insensitivity genotypes as of now available in patient field. Do we have, or these are the only ones using the methodology you identify? Yeah, so I, sir, this method, uh, what he used, it will not be able to uh, distinguish between the qualitative Hello. versus uh, the quanti uh, quantitative photo period insensitivity, but right. it will be able to identify the plant uh, that can flower under uh, short day condition. And then I think he would li like to identify any allelic variation is associated in the non period. The patient remains on the identification of the material. And whether it will change, the, whether photo insensitivity will change with yes, regard sir. to temperature. Yes, sir, right? your question is correct. Uh, to know whether it is really qualitative or it is quantitative, we need additional right. uh, treatment of photo period that will say whether it will remain the same or light. Light. Whether it will white light or any other light, you did not vary. Yes. And did you know the intensity of the light also? Did you know the intensity of the light, Mr. Kishore? Yes, sir, 100 lux uh, is, uh, sorry, 1000, uh, uh, 10,000 lux. I don't accept lux. Tell me in micro Einstein per meter square per second. Anyway, you are talking of a, you know, anyway, we'll talk about that later. Thank you as of now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So if we don't have. So if we don't yeah. have any more questions from the other experts, so we can uh, move on for the ex uh, comments no, what from happened, the Dr. Patra, Dr. Patel, Dr. K. Singh. Sir, yeah, lot of Patra, Dr. Sir, a lot Dr. of discussions have already uh -huh. gone and uh, uh -huh. keeping in view the time. And um, I think the, the core expertise already uh, discussed a lot. And it, uh, my questions may be the superficial questions. Uh, and always in a lateral way, um, I try to ask something. But uh, since um, you mentioned, um, of course, this is again, I think already Dr. Keshi Vansals have already asked, you know, the photo regulatory genes you identified uh, and under the effect of light duration and whether the genes were regulated also uh, to the responses of temperature because you have given the temperatures. Uh, when the duration increased, so also the temperatures. So whether it is um, the temperature having any kind of impact on that. And uh, also if it is so the, the stress, abiotic stress, like the temperature when if it is increased under the high light and all the duration of the light, maybe these also, uh, these genes are resistant to the abiotic stress and that is temperatures, which of course you have not studied. Uh, and that is what I thought. Another interesting thing is that, you know, about the pigeon pea, um, um, a lot of developments taken place. Ikrisat has developed so many varieties uh, since its establishment and uh, long duration varieties we have, short duration varieties we have, um, and short types of varieties we have. Um, but when we, the, at the national level, when we see the average yield, uh, and still it is, you know, I think around 1000 kilogram, one less than one ton or so. Uh, what may be reasons? I, earlier I was reading, you know, that you know when the seeds are taken and, and uh, to Australia, and there the yields are very high. Uh, but the, our seeds taken to Australia, there the productivity is very high. Wherever the performance uh, at our uh, uh, in India, it is so low. So what uh, maybe is it uh, your the problem you are addressing or something? You know the soil, the constraints, and it, because pulse are often neglected. And there is not, you know, the proper irrigation, and then the in the marginal lands, these are mostly grown. Of course, now situation is much, much, much better, and we are, you know, we are we are producing um, much more, you know, what was before few years, 
uh, and uh, almost self-sufficient in the pulse productions or so. Uh, those are the good things. But about the pigeon pea, the status, um, still a uh, lot of things to know and a lot of things to do. So these are my comments and uh, queries what I asked in between. Please, if you can respond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your question, sir. Uh, you rightly said that our productivity is around uh, 800, uh, 800 kg per hectare. And it's remained in from last five, uh, five uh, means last uh, uh, decade, it's a remained uh, near about seven to eight, 800 kg per hectare only. And uh, uh, coming to the uh, point that the cultivation area under cultivation, only eight state of uh, India is a cultivated pigeon pea, majorly cultivated pigeon pea. Uh, that is the, there's a middle region of Maharashtra, uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and then uh, um, MP and Jharkhand. These state are uh, majorly cultivating the pigeon pea, and other state still have scope to uh, uh, to uh, grow the pigeon pea, but the, uh, they uh, cultivated as a minor crop. And in uh, some uh, south region or in some no uh, north region, there is a uh, 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 there is a photo period sensitive in nature, and due to what happened, uh, uh, it is a long uh, it is uh, uh, the uh, Difference in genotype is that some of genotype is flower even after the 55 days and complete its life life cycle in 90 days. And uh, uh, some of the genotypes required uh, up to 270 days for complete its life cycle. And this genotype variation is uh, uh, also, also, uh, also linked to the yield because of the long duration uh, genotypes give the better yield and short duration uh, uh, genotypes give the uh, lower yield. But what happened when we grow these long duration genotypes in the area where it is not adapted or uh, it is not uh, uh, cultivated much more, then also it gives long duration also and uh, poor yielder. So that is the problem and it may be due to the uh, not proper photo period or uh, in some other practices. Sir. Okay, thank you. More discussion we need, but uh, let me stop here because time is very short. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Do just I think mm -hmm. it's my turn. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So first, uh, from where should I start? There are many things to say. From yeah, I'm impatient man, but I have a lot of patience with discussion. And those who need certificate, there are some colleagues still sitting. Vina Gupta is there. Mm -hmm. One night discussion in MBB year went up. It was on digital uh, this data database up to 2.30 a.m. Even though uh -huh. most of the difficulty at MVP are our ladies. Because it is out of discussion, we do some churning and get something. Now, Australia versus uh, 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 India. We I hesitate to do such comparisons. They are used against us. There was T. Ramasamy Committee on Restructuring of ICR and he was all the time quoting figures from other uh, countries. And I used to tell environmental difference. For example, maize, it, only one crop is grown in uh, Northern US compared to two crops over here or many other things. And he didn't listen to me. He always said that I'm talking about ICR, not about PAU because PAU was number one in publication also. Then uh, I found Dr. Rice, sorry, uh, AK, I am going a little bit away. I found Shivaji Pandey, he was also a member. I said, you should participate. You are not participating. Then he gave the example of Himbarapa in Brazil, etc. All those have failed the experiments. What to say of India versus Australia, Dr. Patra? Even within Punjab, we have Pasmati belt, we have cotton belt, we have Kino belt, we have potato belt. Only crop which is grown throughout Punjab is wheat. No other crop. So, I, but at the same time, we must analyze why it is good there. I don't mean that we should close our eyes. Sir, yes, sir. Yes. So we, we, we should study why it is good. Is it due to some manageable factor or unmanageable? It, is it due to endowment or it is otherwise? Please have patience. <laughs> I'm going to touch some issues. Uh, I, I, I feel, first of pigeon pea, photo period is very, very important. Dr. Tripaman. I'm very happy because in Punjab, Haryana, we need diversification. Only crop which can help in diversification is pigeon pea. 
We are not worried about meat. We are worried about maize. We did the analysis, even though yield is less or poor or good among all four crops. There are four candidate crops, mung bean, urd bean, pigeon pea, and groundnut. We have to make comparison with three season crops. Cotton and maize, they need marketing support. They can compete. These are the other four crops. Pigeon pea come on the top. And major factor for pigeon pea is photosensitivity. These are long duration varieties which affect wheat yield also. Same thing is with soybean also, but soybean is not. A yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. So, Dr. Tripaman, I am very happy with you and with, with your uh, uh, guide that you selected this problem. And about this is one of the best examples which Dr. Swami Nathan used to tell in the class from 270 days to 180 days. At that time, we have gone up to 180 days. Now, PAG varieties mature in 120 days. We have very good linkage with the increase at, in spite of all this good germplasm. I will ask this whether this 2 to 3 8 also they are tested or not. We are not able to make impact because still now wheat yield goes down. That, that, that's the problem. I got uh, wonderful material from uh, Dr. A.K. Singh from IRA uh, with swing gate manipulation. We are still working on this aggregates, etc. Maybe something come out of it. Now, coming to pigeon pea, this is a crop on which not much work has been done. And when there were questions, uh, Dr. Mansell, sorry, bhai, and other colleagues also sorry. It, it, to me, it just looked like that we are working, I mean, if I am Dr. Thri, uh, Mr. Taripagun, I am working as a blind man groping the elephant because not much work has been done. But had I been in place of Dr. Taripagun, I would have grown probably in open and then try to, because temperature is important. And temperature is correlated to photo period, as Dr. Tripavan told. So I would try, would have tried to mimic uh, the other factors, whatever I could mimic under the natural conditions. That's why I say that plant breeding, large germplasm experiment are not difficult to control all the things. But Dr. Tripavan at the same time said that most of the work on, in, in USA has been done like that. The objective of a student in U.S. University or Western University different than the objective of the student work here in India. They are more working for publication, for basic information. We want to work on basic information which you can use. Here it should, I would like to bring, uh, link it more with the breeding work. When you control other factors, it may be very good from physiological angle, but for a breeder, it may have limited. But if you mimic the other factors as in the nature, as in the population of environment in which the input is to be used from your study for developing the germplasm. Then I will not much worry about other factors, I will try to mimic as far as possible. So, and if uh, Dr. Ramon, if you like to have, because what is being done in the USA, there is a gentleman, maybe I don't know if he is now alive, if he should be alive, I think. Dr. A.F. Troyer, he worked in physical genetics, Retired in some time 80s, started writing late 90s in crop science, late 90s and early 20s in medica, in crop science, and I think in plant breeding also. He wrote in one of the papers, the, the title of all the papers, Major Germplasm, Major History, Historical Development, etc., that my publications are laid by 15 to 20 years because of propriety issues. They will not tell you in time. I will spend half a minute more. I visited Pioneer in 1982. They showed me everything except for their biotechnology lab. Building Bar Khadi. This is our biotechnology lab. Because they, 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 they will not tell us. And they, why, why should they tell us? They have to earn their pay also. We will get pay from government of government of Punjab. That, that's the major difference. So with that background, uh, my request uh, you said request to all the colleagues because I am taking, I am going a little bit far away because I many times feel that we are asking questions, we are putting the students in awkward position a little bit, unjustified. Sometimes I feel. And Dr. Basil, very good. Yeah, you called Dr. Vishwanathan because I gave suggestions yesterday also. Maybe Dr. Ekasin, you can give after every publication two minutes for, uh, for interaction with the faculty. Student has come, student has gone. As earlier, what was the name? Dr. Neeraj, he has gone. 
our suggestion, Dr. Mansur's suggestions, my suggestion, Dr. Patra, Dr. Patel, Dr. K. Singh, other colleagues are more relevant to the faculty which is working there. So they are all attending, sir, and they are all listening. They but are I, want, I, 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 my request is, I am very happy that Dr. Mansur took one more step. He is more bold than I am also bold, but uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, so maybe okay. if the chair permits, I can, uh, I mean, request uh, the, the chairman of the students. From next year, not this year. To, no, no, if no, he no. is able to, very specific next. questions that has been asked ne and the chairman. Ne next year. No, I, I, I am answering that. many questions by telling my experience. I am answering, trying to answer many questions. Uh, you said seven insensitive genes. Uh, uh, we mean only in this cross there are seven genes. There may be more in, you identified three genotypes. Dr. Tripoman? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You studied only ones. So there may be more than seven. Yes, I have sir. more questions also. Yes. But I will not ask. I will only say that I'm I was happy with the way ahead or work with Neeraj, but I'm more happy with you with way ahead. You gave a combination of breeding and as well as basic research. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So now we will move on to the next presentation, which is by Mr. Dash Manranjan from uh, Division of Nematology. Honorable Chairman of the session, respected jury members, distinguished scientists and students, I welcome you all to my presentation. It is now a well-established fact that plant parasitic nematodes are one of the major pests for global food security. Like other pests whose damage symptoms are distinctly visible, nematode damage symptoms are often ignored. They cause an annual crop loss of about $173 billion globally and $102 billion rupees in India. Among the top 10 plant parasitic nematodes, root knot nematodes are considered as the most destructive one. Among root knot nematodes, rice root knot nematode Meldogynic raminicola is causing havoc in rice. Among several management practices for this nematode, use of nematicides seemed lucrative, but their adversities on non-targets and environment is undeniable. In this therapeutic bottleneck situation, host resistance serves as a sustainable and efficient approach. Host plant resistance towards nematodes can be due to several factors. In order to identify specific pathways related to nematode resistance mechanisms, more studies regarding compatible and incompatible interactions are needed where both host and nematode factors can be studied. In a previous study, a panel of activation tag mutants were developed in an Indica rice land race JBT3614. Four such mutant lines showed high resistance to Meldogynic raminicola. However, the mechanism of resistance in these lines are unknown. Coming to the research gaps, Complete molecular mechanism of rice meldogynic raminicola resistance reactions are unknown. Further information about nematode derived effectors and plant proteins interacting with it are also scant. Keeping this in mind, my PhD work was formulated with these following objectives. Whole genome and transcriptome sequencing of selected resistant and susceptible activation mut tag mutant rice lines for genome-wide identification of genes imparting resistance to meldogynic raminicola, identification and characterization of meldogynic raminicola effectors and functional validation of key effectors involved in nematode rice interaction, and identification of cognate rice proteins interacting with se selected nematode effectors. In my first objective, I used the mutant lines mentioned before. Four mutant lines, uh, 8, 9, 11, and 15, along with their JBT3614 background, were sequenced. The NGS data was then analyzed using a standard pipeline. Quality filtering showed more than 90% high quality reads in the samples, of which more than 98% could be aligned on the reference indica genome. Unusual to a tDNA insertion mutant, we identified a large number of SNP and indial variants among the mutant lines compared to their background. Highest SNP and indial variants were observed in the chromosome number 1 for all mute four lines. Majority of these variants were in the intergenic region. Majority of the indels were short indels of 1 to 3 base pair length and majority of the base substitutions were transitions. We identified many SNP or indel variant containing genes to be common in all mutant lines with many genes with variants at the same genomic locations. Annotation showed Majority of such genes were involved in metabolism and regulation. Several of such genes were also involved in governing resistance or tolerant traits and many belong to several families of transcription factors. 
20 orthologs of Arabidopsis susceptibility genes were also containing uh, com common variants with predicted modifier and moderate effects. These ACE genes are known to be compatibility factors and their impaired function can hamper FOSH pathogen interaction. In summary, a large number of SNP and Indel variants were identified in mutant lines compared to its JBT3614 background that might be contributing to nematode resistance in addition to the activation tag. SNP and Indel variants were identified in genes related to transcription factors, metabolism and resistant traits common in all mutants. Several putative susceptibility genes also contained variants which might lead to their impaired function. Also, whole genome of an Indica rice land race JBT3614 was sequenced. We then used an RNA sequencing experiment to identify the mechanism of early defense responses towards nematode in line 9. Nematode infected JBT3614 was used as a control for this experiment. RNA was extracted from infected roots 24 hours post inoculation and post quality check cDNA was synthesized and sequenced. The data generated was analyzed by a standard alignment based pipeline to identify differentially expressed genes. Quality filtering showed more than 90% high quality reads, among which more than 85% reads could be aligned to the reference. Among the expressed genes, 674 genes were found to be differentially expressed in line 9. Metabolic pathway and biosynthesis of secondary metabolites were highly enriched with differentially expressed genes. Membrane and oxidation reduction processes related genes were also highly differentially expressed. When the DEGs were annotated into 36 groups using a MapMan software, signaling was found to be mostly enriched with DEGs followed by stress. Also, several genes involved in biotic and abiotic stress responses in rice were differentially expressed. In addition to this, many genes involved in biosynthetic pathway of diterpenoid phytoalexin in line 9 were seen to be upregulated. However, no known regulators of this pathway like diterpenoid phytoalexin factors were differentially expressed. 26 transcripts were selected for QRT-PCR assay for validation of RNA-seq data. 6 out of 26 genes were not significantly expressed. In summary, the RNA-seq data suggested that the expression of several signaling-related genes including receptor like kinases, NLRs, wall-associated receptor kinases might be helping in early recognition of invading nematodes. Expression of defense-related proteins including expression of PR genes might be ethylene or jasmonate mediated and also upregulation of multiple genes involved in diterpenoid phytoalexin biosynthesis might be responsible for the early defense response against meldogynic reminicola in mutant line 9. In the second objective, meldogynic reminicola IRA strain genome was used to predict 561 secretory proteins by screening them for secretion signals and cellular localization signals. Additionally, 52 putative effector orthologs were identified from the meldogynic reminicola genome based on comparative sequence analysis. Partial sequences of 14 such identified sequences were amplified from nematode juveniles. Among these, 13 genes with different predicted functions were selected for functional validation uh, of their role in nematode penetration and development using in vitro RNAi through dsRNA soaking approach. After quantifying Target gene expression post DSRNA soaking, the treated nematodes were inoculated on PB1121 seedlings in pleuronic gel. The effect of DSRNA soaking on nematode penetration was recorded after 24 hours, and effect of RNAi on galling and life cycle was observed 16 days post inoculation. Expression quantification of target genes post DSRNA soaking showed that only three target genes were downregulated while all other target genes were upregulated. Change in concentration of dsRNA or time of incubation didn't change the trend of expression. Even if the target gene was not downregulated, change in phenotype was observed in dsRNA treated nematode compared to water control and GAP treated nematode. Highest reduction in penetration of juvenile was observed after silencing Pioneer MSP gene and FLP18. DSRNA treatment also caused reduction in nematode multiplication factor, which is a measure of their reproductive fitness. Now, the MSP3 and FLP18 silenced nematodes showed more than 60% reduction in multiplication factor followed by calactin. However, in the exp expansion silenced worms, no significant reduction was observed. Expression of these target genes was also observed in different stages of the nematode life cycle. Most of the target genes were found to be expressed highly in the juveniles and egg stages. Annual degrading enzymes were highly expressed in the juvenile stages. In summary, 
561 secretory proteins and 52 methylene graminicola genome was identified functional evaluation of 13 mel Meldogynic graminicola genes through in vitro RNA led to reduction in root penetration up to 60% and reduction in nematode multiplication factor up to 55% for the selected gene. In the third objective, we tried to identify the host targets of Meldogynic graminicola CLE gene. Previously, some of the nematode CLE genes were known to mimic plant CLE peptides to hijack CLE signaling in plants. We used each two hybrid approach to identify rice proteins interacting with CLE gene. For this, matchmaker gold is to hybrid system was used. CLE gene sequence without its signal peptide was cloned into PGBK T7 vector to be used as bait. Rice root rich cDNA was used for preparation of prey library. Bait and prey constructs were then transformed into different E strains and allowed to mate. The diploids formed was screened for the activation of reporter genes present in them. Using CLE bait, to screen rice prey library led to identification of several putative positive colonies which were then further confirmed on dropout media for screening the activation of reporter genes. Further confirmation of interaction was done by one-to-one -one interaction of CLE bait with the four identified rice proteins. From this assay, four rice proteins interacting with Meldogynic Raminicola CLE gene were identified which are involved in apoptosis transcription, translation, and modulation of presinosteroid biosynthesis genes in rice, respectively. This yeah, result suggests the possible was... role of CLE protein in suppression of okay. plant defense responses by modulating apoptosis and presinosteroid production and modulation of basic cellular physiology for feeding site formation. In conclusion, subject to validation, variant containing genes identified in the rice mutant lines might be involved in nematode resistance. Pathways associated with early defense responses of rice against Meldogynic graminicola were identified. Putative secretory proteins and orthologous plant parasitic effector sequences were identified from Meldogynic graminicola, and genes imported for nematode penetration and multiplication factors were evaluated through RNAi. Also, putative host targets of a nematode secretor effector were identified. This work can be further extended by validation of the role of genes identified in mutant lines predicted to be involved in nematode resistance, identification of unknown regulator of diterpenoid phytolex in biosynthesis pathway, identification of factors leading to upregulation of target gene expression post dsRNA treatment, and validation of protein-protein interaction of CLA gene with identified proteins in confirmation of their roles as plant factors for nematode establishment. Coming to publications. The research paper with findings of RNA-seq experiment were published in Planta. Identification of secretory proteins and putative effectors was published as a part of Meldogynic Raminicola genome in Gene. The paper containing findings from the whole genome sequencing of rice mutants is under review in Frontiers in Plant Science. Uh, I have presented my work in several inter international conferences, both as oral presentation and posters, and have won conference scholarships. I would like to thank my chairperson, and advisory committee, division of nematology, PG school IRA, and NAIB Kast for financial assistance and everyone who helped me through this period. Thank you for your attention. Here we have the questions from Dr. Bansal. I don't know why every time. <laughs> <laughs> because you do very critical analysis. Mm -hmm. we, are no, taking no, a, no. we are taking advantage of your critical analysis. No, no, that's fine, but actually in this presentation I had a little problem of my internet as well. But nevertheless, I think the last part I could still, you know, understand. And I would like to ask, in fact, also a question which may I may like to take it from Dr. Virang Gupta. It is in chat box, which I will take it. In fact, with a, you know, did you use the rice? She has written about the land race of rice. Did you use one in your studies, Mr. Dash, Mr. Manorajan? The rice genotype which you have used is the land race of rice, particular number she has mentioned in the chat box. Have you used that, right? Uh, yes, sir. It was a land race, but uh, it was. Not Where did you use the obtain the seeds from? Uh, it was obtained from NRRI cutup when it, uh, the mutants were being developed. Can you be a little loud, please? I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me, sir? No, no. Yes, my volume is maximum. Can you speak loudly a little bit? Where did you uh, obtain seeds from? CRI Kata? Uh, yes, sir. NRI Kata. Okay, now NRI Kata. Okay. Uh, 
There's a suggestion given by Harris that you should give an IC number. You know what is IC number? Uh, yes, sir, but uh, uh, I didn't develop it, so uh, that's why I didn't. Nobody is asking you whether you developed it or not. Do you know what is IC number? Uh, no, sir. Anyway, that's not expected from a student of pneumatology, but I, it's expected from a PhD student from IRI. Irrespective of what field you are, if you use your material, you must have a thorough knowledge about the material. But anyway, coming to, to the last part of your presentation, you said you identified some four putative rice proteins, yes, which are producing the CLE protein of the nematode, right? Yes, sir. So did you do some analysis of those four rice proteins? What are those genes? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I could only identify them through the ISPO hybrid screen. I couldn't uh, follow up uh, any uh, further uh, functional validation. Uh, no, what are those types of there. proteins? What types of proteins are those? What are their molecular mass? And whether you could know the right genome sequence is available, you could easily go down to the level of at least the cDNA, if not the full length gene. Uh, yes, sir. I know the uh, sequences, uh, the name of them. Uh, one was uh, mitochondrial uh, voltage. Uh, dependent anion channel protein. Uh, another two were from uh, uh, a RNA dependent DNA polymerase and, uh, and uh, uh, a ribosomal protein. And another one was uh, a transcription factor that is uh, regulating the synthesis of uh, by pressing of steroids. I don't know, you have some problem with your sound. Actually, you're making it too close to your mouth. Um, so it's not clear to me actually what you're saying. These are different. You, but you did not mention about these results. You have done it, in fact, in your thesis. I would have expected that. And the, in the in the further you know path ahead, you could have mentioned about it that if those you know sequences of those genes where this particular scaly protein is interacting, if they could be mutated, you know, which is now the strategy that world over people are talking about it. You know, Dr. Vishnuadan can tell you more if you talk to him you know, about genome editing. And, and there are examples of similar kind, you know, in, in, in rice with regard to bacterial leaf blight resistance, you know, through such a mechanism. Uh, actually, sir, we are uh, in the middle of that experiment uh, uh, because... Uh, uh, oh, bolo, yaar. Kya so, bolo na. Keep, we are the, keep this mouth up, mouthpiece away a little bit. The mic is too near mouth. Uh, now, am I audible clearly? Not really. Just say something. I'm bolre. I'm saying something. Why can't you say it? Yeah. Just say something. Bolu na. What's the problem? Right now. Yeah. Yes. This better. This better. Okay. So uh, we are. Uh, we have not yet uh, confirmed it with uh, uh, other protein-protein interaction assay. So first we have to do that, uh, which will be taken up by somebody else from my lab, and uh, then uh, some overexpression or knockout studies can be done to see. Uh, its effect on uh, nematode in invasion or uh, development of feeding sites. All right, anyway, we can discuss later about that. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, Dr. Patra. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Thus, uh, very good presentation and your slides were very good and you spoke very well on the problem uh, of uh, uh, you know, the topic is the on the melodogyne graminicola, the problem in rice. You know, normally uh, I was knowing that it is more problem in the protected agriculture that is the emerging and also many vegetables are affected by the nematodes, but also of course, uh, there is a lot of problem with the rice. So uh, as per the, you know, is there any, any agroecological zones or it is across all the kind of uh, agroclimatic conditions, soils, this problem is prevalent. Um, and uh, if uh, uh, in a specialized uh, specific areas uh, um, where this problem is more severe, uh, could you tell that thing? And um, how much losses at present, you know, any estimations made uh, due to this MG in rice crop? Uh, of course, uh, the study, your study is very good, I should say, the uh, genetic strategy, and this offers an effective and economic alternatives to other 
uh, nematode controlling uh, practices um, and uh, your results are encouraging. Um, and I'm sure also the previously the uh, studies made on the particularly on the in the rice crop or uh, the germ plasms uh, and uh, you have you have taken uh, those um, uh, the, um, the results and the achievements uh, in your uh, observations and studies. So my my queries are, are those two: um, how much losses at present due to this problem, and any any is there any agroclimatic conditions or this the reasons where this problem is more prevalent? Uh, sir, this nematode is uh, biologically a tropical nematode, but uh, right now. Uh, uh, in all uh, rice growing uh, agroclimatic zone, uh, this nematode has emerged as an important uh, pest. Uh, and uh, in because in in mainly in North India also, uh, uh, because it can also uh, uh, infect wheat. So uh, the population level doesn't go down. So also in uh, southern and eastern India, monoculture of rice uh, is always there. So. Uh, 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 time uh, by time, this uh, nematode has uh, uh, been increasing uh, its losses. And uh, uh, right now, uh, as uh, predicted by uh, AICRP of nematodes, uh, on nematodes, 16% uh, uh, yield loss uh, is there because of uh, this nematode on rice. Uh, and uh, it accounts for up to uh, 23,000 million uh, rupees. Uh, so uh, loss is, uh, that's the loss because of this. Okay, that is good. Very good. All the best. Thank you. Maybe the chairperson of the student, Dr. Umar Rao, would like to clarify one or two points quickly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dakuja. Uh, this is just to give a clarification to Dr. Bansal's question about the Klee gene. I would like to tell you, he worked for two years to identify this one effector interacting with the rice. He tried several other effectors, but it was very hard for us to get it. Therefore, he could not do further validation using BIFC, as well as we had planned to do some knockout studies as well. But you know how much time it would take. He has already completed five years. So he was under stress to submit. Therefore, this validation could not, have, could not be done further. Nematode is the only animal where a clavata-like gene has been found. Otherwise, clavatas are present only in the plant system. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So now I will invite the chairperson, sir. How about Dr. Sir. Gaur? I could see him. Okay. Dr. Gaur, you have nematode. <laughs> Yes, sir. In fact, it's a very new emerging problem. It has been there in India in many parts, particularly coastal and eastern parts. North India also in 19s started to appearing very, you know, and numbers are, densities are increasing. Particularly this rice wheat system, this has become a problem. And wherever water stress is there, uh, it's a problem. Nurseries are particularly more affected. And uh, this is uh, making me rampant. In fact, there is a combination of uh, uh, at least three species I know, which in fact rice. Graminicola is more popular in that. I don't know how far they are uh, defined. But uh, there are three diff different species of uh, root knot nematodes, which in fact rice. And uh, Graminicola is most uh, prom prominent among those. And losses, uh, in fact, uh, the range basically, I have seen losses of just 2 or 3 percent to even crop failures. Uh, in fact, in IRA itself, I've seen a complete crop failure at one, one stage. Direct seeded rice is more affected, but puddle rice is less affected. Uh, or transplanted rice is less affected. So, but you, nursery bed treatment is the best method to control here. But I'm really glad that uh, at molecular level also good progress is being made. And uh, this may go a long way in uh, developing good resistant varieties of selecting materials. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you very much. I will not give any comments after you have said something. Only I will emphasize direct seed rice. That is one important option for Punjab and Haryana to save water. So that it is very pertinent uh, so project. Bed, no, mm -hmm. bed, but no, unless uh, 
these mm. bad conditions and direct seed it uh, is uh, more particularly and uh, particularly sandy soils like Punjab it will be, become more serious. But we have to take uh, side by side nematode management methods. Otherwise, it will be difficult to have uh, direct seed rice there. Thank you. So, Dr. Dash, thank you very much for very good work, very good presentation, very good publications. I have only one minor uh, point. Uh, it is about authorship, but, but I will not uh, explain or say anything in detail about the authorship. That's all. I will just give a hint. I think, Dr. Dhoja, we can move forward. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, next presentation is by Mr. Kuleshwar Prasad Sahu from the Discipline of Plant Pathology. Respected chairperson, jury members, distinguished scientists, and my dear friends, I am Kuleshwar Prasad Sahu representing Division of Plant Pathology and welcome you all on today's merit medal presentation. Human body is a complex organization and microbes do find place there. Microorganisms associated with a particular ecological niche is called as microbiome. Several journals have reported the importance of microbiome in health and diseases and their role in shaping behavior across many taxa. So, where does the role of microbiome felt in plant health? The question has to be answered. We all are aware about this disease triangle where environment play a very important role in disease causation. This environment has two components, biological environment and physical environment. And this microbiome constitute the biological environment. So, what is the role of this biological environment in plant health and diseases? Whenever a plant is attacked by pathogen, it also interacts with the bi biological environment or the microbiome. So, can we utilize this microbiome to manage the plant diseases like rice blast for sustainable crop production? Rice being an important staple is also attacked by several diseases. Among them, blast is major. With the recent ban on the most effective chemical tricyclazole and rejection of the rice consignment by various countries has prompted us to design a better management practice for rice blast disease. This background, a thesis title was proposed as a structural and functional analysis of rice phylospheric bacteria for their antimicrobial properties and defense elicitations against blast disease. With three objectives, first is to compare and decipher the structure and composition of phylospheric microbiome on rice genotypes grown in two contrasting agroclimatic conditions. Second is to elucidate the role of phylospheric bacterial communities against rice blast fungus. And third is to characterize antifungal metabolites of most effective antagonistic phylospheric bacteria against blast disease. For the first objective, we have selected two rice genotypes. One is PUSA 1602, which is resistant to blast. Another is PRR 78, which is susceptible to blast. Both are planted in two contrasting agroclimatic conditions. One representing mountain ecosystem, that is Palampur. Another representing coastal ecosystem, that is Port Blair. Sampling was done, followed by MNGS analysis as well as microbiological analysis. For the whole phylosphere microbiome analysis, rice leaves were vortex with phosphate buffer saline and the helicot was pelleted down and then subjected for total DNA isolation. This total DNA was subjected for amplification of the V3, V4 hypervariable region of the 16S RNA gene of the bacteria and then preparation of the library and then followed by metagenomic sequencing using alumina mice platform. The data was analyzed using fast QC software for quality checking followed by adaptive framing and removal of the low quality reads by trimomatic followed by pair and joining using pair and then submission to MGRAS for taxonomic analysis. The data was also submitted to NCBI GenBank to make it pub available for scientific communities. The data was also subjected for principal coordinate analysis, linear discriminant analysis, core microbiome by alpha diversity as well as network analysis. This table represents the read statistics of the metagenomic data with MGRAS accession number as well as NCBI accession numbers. But after that, alpha diversity indices for rice phylo microbiome was calculated and we observed that xenon diversity index was higher than 2 for all the samples which indicated diverse microbiome profile of rice phylosphere. Further, the diversity, abundance and distribution of rice phylospheric microbiome was calculated and analyzed for phylum level, class level, order level and family level. And we found that proteobacteria, echinobacteria and formicutes found to be the dominant phyla while Enterobacteriaceae, Microbacteriaceae, Sphingomonadaceae, and Bacillaceae were observed as dominant families. Further, the genus level distribution revealed the abundance of Pentova, Exotobacterium, Bacillus, and Methylobacterium on the rice phylosphere. The core microbiome analysis revealed the presence of 24 bacterial genera found to be associated with the rice core phylomicrobiome with maximum prevalence of Pentova and Exotobacterium. 
The principal coordinate analysis of the metagenomic data represented the environmental conditions as the main driver of the phylomicrobium assembly rather than the genotype per se. The linear discriminant analysis of the phylomicrobiome data revealed the biomarker profile for both genotype as well as the locations. Sparse CC based network analysis revealed a complex competitive as well as cooperative nature of microbial interaction on rice phyllosphere. Further, to validate the metagenomic data, culturomic approach was adopted. Briefly, the aliquot was serially diluted, followed by pore plating and then incubation. After that, morphotyping and population estimation was done, followed by purification as well as preservation. This is the population size of the bacteria isolated from mountain zone and a total of 38 bacterial morphotypes were isolated and preserved. Similarly, this bar diagram shows population statistics of the bacteria isolated from island zone and a total 40 bacterial morphotypes were isolated and preserved. After that, polyphasic genetic characterization of bacterial isolates were conducted. The total genomic DNA was isolated and subjected for box PCR based fingerprinting followed by gel electrophoresis as well as amplicon profiling. The amplicon profile was used for diversity analysis and elimination of the duplicates. Further, the 16S rRNA gene was amplified and the amplicons were bidirectionally sequenced using Sanger sequencing platform. The Sanger reads were quantic assembled using DNA baser followed by sequence curation and then species identification from NCBI BLAST. After that, we submitted the data to the NCBI GenBank to get the accession numbers. This table represents the GenBank accession number generated for all the bacterial isolates. After that, we studied the colony pigmentation on the nutrient media and we found that phylosphere adopted bacteria produce dark pigmented colonies on nutrient media. Further, the scanning electron microscopy of the rice leaf surface revealed the physical presence of microbes on the rice leaf surface. This is all about objective 1. Moving towards objective 2 where we functionally characterize this phylospheric bacteria. First, with the in vitro antagonistic assay against rice blast fungus using secretory metabolite mediated as well as volatile organic compound mediated antagonism. A range of inhibition by these bacterial isolates was observed and a total 14 isolate displayed over 40% inhibition of mycelial growth by their secretory metabolites while 15 of them gave 100% inhibition by their volatile organic compound. After that, the nature of bacterial volatile mediated antagonism was studied and we found that 5 bacterial volatiles were fungicidal in nature while remaining showed fungistatic activity. Based on the in vitro interactions, a total 43 bacterial isolates belonging to 13 genera were selected where we also included some of the our previous collection. Initially, phenotyping for microbiome mediated immunocompetence was conducted using four different dilutions of the bacteria where rice seeds were allowed to germinate and the data was taken for germination percentage as well as root and shoot length. The effect of bacterial suspension on rice seed germination showed us that with the increase in bacterial titer, there is a decrease in germination percentage. The analysis of shoot length growth as well as root length growth revealed a phenomenon of seedling growth inhibition which is known as marker for mem triggered immunity. After that, these bacterial isolates were subjected for blast disease suppression. Briefly, the germinated seeds were treated with the bacterial suspension followed by their growth under greenhouse condition. A prophylactic spray of bacteria was given before the challenge inoculation by the pathogen and then after 7 to 10 days post inoculation, the disease symptoms were appeared. The scoring was done using 0 to 5 scale given by Meckel and Boneman and the range of disease reaction was observed on the rice leaf. The percent disease index as well as reduction in disease severity was calculated. Out of 43 bacterial isolates, a total 17 of them gave more than 50% reduction against the disease severity and these 17 isolates belong to 8 different genes. These 17 isolates were subsequently used for gene expression analysis. Briefly, the seedlings were treated with the bacterial suspension, followed by sampling for three time points. Total RNA was isolated, and this RNA was used for qPCR analysis to see the expression pattern of the defense related genes. A total of eight defense related genes were selected, which were marker for RLK, RLP, SAR, ISR, phytolexin production, and PR protein production. Significant upregulation of the two defense related gene OSCBP and CRK was observed by most of the bacterial isolates. These two are RLP and RLK respectively. Similarly, OSPAD4, OSEDS1 and PDF2.2 were also upregulated by most of the bacterial treatments. These are markers for ISR as well as defense genes.
नेक्रोटिक लीजन एज सोन बाई द पॉजिटिव कंट्रोल सो वी कैन कंसिडर हियर दैट दीज फाइलोस्फेरिक एसोसिएटेड बैक्टीरिया आर पोटेंशियली नॉन पैथोजेनिक इन नेचर आफ्टर दैट कीमो प्रोफाइलिंग ऑफ बैक्टीरिया वोलटाइल कंपाउंड थ्रू सॉल्वन एक्सट्रक्शन मेथड वॉज कंडक्टेड एंड जी सी एम एस प्रोफाइल वॉज जनरेटेड दिस इज द जी सी एम एस प्रोफाइल ऑफ फोर सेलेक्टेड बैक्टीरियल आइसोलेट्स एंड वी ऑब्जर्व द रेंज ऑफ ऑर्गेनिक केमिकल्स फाउंड टू बी एसोसिएटेड विद द बैक्टीरियल वोलाटाइल प्रोफाइल एंड दे वेर पोटेंशियल एंटी माइक्रोवेल इन नेचर ऑल्सो So the salient findings of my works are metagenomic data for two rice genotypes and two locations revealed the association of diverse microbiota on the rice phylosphere. Members of the proteobacteria, actinobacteria, and firmicutes are most dominant microbiota on the rice phylosphere. 24 bacterial genera compose the rice core phylomicrobiome. Environmental factors play key role in shaping the phylomicrobiome composition, and Pentoa is identified as most dominant bacterial genus by both metagenomic and cultural methods. A total of 17 isolates showed a more than 50% decrease in the blast disease severity which also elicited defense related genes blast disease suppression is due to combined effect of the direct antagonism activation of the host defense and desaturation Se several antifungal compounds were detected through gcms analysis the thesis project culminated in the identification of phylosphere adopted bacterial communities for the microbiome transplantation mediated disease management future course of action may be field testing of the effective isolates as well as formulation and commercialization i have two publications one in nas rating 10.5 another in nas rating 11.6 and one more article is under review in environmental microbiome journal i have also participated in several scientific meetings and presented my work as oral presentation i also served as boss member in the division member of editorial board of the ira annual magazine as well as chief coordinator of all india agricultural students association I have also received several awards from different professional organizations. Finally, I would like to show my humble gratitude to my chairperson and advisory committee, all faculty members, PG School, Dr. Rathor from Palampur and Dr. Shaktivel from Port Blair for research for providing research facilities, lab members, parents, friends, senior juniors, CSIR for providing fellowship and NHP cast for providing research now. Thank you one and all. I would like to invite Dr. Bansal again uh, for the <laughs> comments. So, Mr. Sahu, um, finally, even if you have succeeded in identifying some of these uh, bacterial isolates, you know, could be useful for providing resistance to this particular fungus causing blast disease, okay. important disease in rice. So, how are you going to deploy these for at the field level for resistance development for for you know protecting the you know rice from blast? What strategy can you propose? We are not able to hear you. Are you on mute or what? Kuleshwar, we, can we no? can't hear you, Kuleshwar. Um, yes, hello. We are... Yes, yes. Am I audible, ma'am? Now? Yes. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for this question. Actually, uh, some of the bacteria uh, among these six bacteria have already taken with the academic and industry collaborative project in the same lab under uh, my uh, with my guide only, Dr. A. Kumar. And uh, six of them bacteria we have uh, they have developed a, a microbiome formulation for the phylospheric spray against the uh, against rice blast disease. So actually, it is a, a first kind of approach where for a particular foliar disease. Uh, um, uh, foliar spray of biocontrol agent in a consortia and mm -hmm. sir personally i have visited there are field trials have been also conducted uh, and with the company and i have also visited and the key observation what i what i have seen in the field uh, is that apart from the reduction in the blast disease there is another probiotic feature with the rice uh, there is a significant um, there is a increase in the leaf width of the flag leaf 
uh, with this uh, as compared to the control plum that i have personally visited the field and i have observed and uh, uh, that flag oh. leaf has uh, directly related with the uh, uh, grain yield so yes sir it is uh, uh, okay. Okay. At, at the field I just level sir the not working okay thank you but point is again you know you have to depend on spraying these you know kind of uh, yes, a microbial yes, load yes, and, and we don't know what exactly probably will be sanitized what kind of microbial load at what stage and how many days before and how you going to predict you know and you know whether the disease is going to to occur and you know that's one problem normally we have in general some other problems that get sprayed so what do you think compared to the microbial spray versus the genotypes which as through breeding we have been developing you know resistant genotypes what do you think is a better strategy according to you yes sir uh, resistant breeding actually this uh, pathogen hemibiotic pathogen and within field diversity has also been reported uh, it is highly uh, uh, virulence level continuously evolving so definitely resistant breeding is the best method i uh, but uh, apart from resistant breeding we, we can complement that strategy uh, uh, with uh, microbiome formulation Uh, so that uh, uh, new races of the pathogen should not appear and uh, farmers farmers could get a better okay. Uh, okay. Uh, be management be short mr you know pleasure i have got several questions you know also there, is there any any report in the literature where with using your approach that they have succeeded in isolating such bacterial isolates and successfully demonstrated for controlling any disease for that matter in any crop or including rice blast for example no Yes, sir. There is one uh, Pantoa vegans has been already registered in apple. Okay, which and is a phylospheres adopted bacteria. Yes, sir. Right. In so USA, where, wherever you collected this microbiome, you know, from two different locations. So the rice genotype which were grown were they susceptible or, or resistant to, or was that was that important to know whether it was susceptible or resistant to particular blast disease? Yes, sir. The basic reason behind that, sir. Uh, uh, we wanted to see the effect uh, the target was blast disease so we wanted to see the effect tens as well as the safety uh, of the plant with the microbiome composition so my uh, research was basically framed for uh, part of basic research to study the microbiome composition as well as a functional effect so for this uh, we targeted the blast disease circulation and uh, susceptible as well as resistant what is the reaction between the pheno these phenotypes on the microbiome composition are bhai my simple question was the genotypes which you used were whether resistant or susceptible to blast yes sir it is uh, pusa 1602 is resistant sir and prr 78 is uh, susceptible you use both yes sir two varieties we, we have taken at each location yeah both the location yes sir okay okay now also when you identify you know, uh, bacterial okay. you know isolates you use the 16s ribosomal rna uh, to to differentiate it from the nuclear genomic contaminants is it right yes sir yes sir so then you think 16s ribosomal rna is not present in plants sorry sir i am not able to hear sir 16s ribosomal rna is it not uh, there in plants is only available or present in bacteria 60 ml ribosomal rna sir uh, in mitochondrial and chloroplast it may be present but uh, it is a species uh, signature it is a taxonomic marker so we can specifically use for uh, uh, our bacteria so it is used you, as a taxonomic marker for uh, bacteria you use that kind of a marker right yes sir no but did you come across the contamination how did you avoid that that's what my question was sir we filtered the mitochondrial reads and uh, chloroplast reads Okay, so you didn't mention that in your in your methodology. Yes, and, sir. yes, sir. And finally, you mentioned about seventeen, you know, bacterial isolates, which you then finally were able to induce, you know, some defense-related genes, right? Correct, sir. Yes, sir. So, which were the one, you know, NPR one is already known. So you came back to the same conclusion that already known genes are and playing the same role for providing resistance to blast disease. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, range NPR one is one among them. Uh, all the eight uh, eight genes I have selected, sir, and these genes are selected based on to see the diversity. Like uh, some are the PTI, uh, some of the key PTI which uh, which uh, in, indicates the MAM triggered immunity, like chitin elicitor binding protein and CRK, and then marker for ISR as well as uh, 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 SAR, like NPR one. And the so, strategy. 
you're going to propose is going to be race specific? No, sir. Actually, what I have used, sir, it is the most virulent strain present in the North Indian uh, right now in uh, IRI. Dr. G. Prakash is working. Against okay. that, I have screened under greenhouse condition. So, Where, definitely. Whether there is a, a possibility of using an approach for a race specific control of blast? Race specific? No, sir. It is a uh, broad range we are targeting, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Would you like to have the question from director, sir? Yes. Uh, thank you, Kuleshwar. Excellent presentation. Thank and you, uh, very good work done. I have a couple of questions. You know, when you said you have characterized the phallosphere, yeah. can you, uh, uh, you know, fragment it in terms of uh, callosphere and uh, phylloplane, anthosphere and uh, carposphere? That is the bacterial isolates which you isolated. Uh, what proportion belong to stem, leaves, flowers, and fruits? Number one. Sure. Number two. Yeah, let me first finish my question. Number two, you have taken two rice genotypes. One is PUSA 1602, which has yes. got two genes for resistance to blast, PIZ5 and PI54. And PRR78 does not have any resistance to blast. What is the relationship between, and this is a sort of, you know, isogenic lines because it is in the background of PRR78, the two genes uh, have been incorporated through marker-assisted backcross breeding uh, by us and then uh, the resultant was 1602. So what was the rationale of uh, analyzing the phylosphere variation in relation to the blast resistant and the blast susceptible genotype? And what was the difference in the population structure of phylosphere? How you could associate the blast resistant genes with the phylosphere? Because those blast resistant genes are fungal genes, and this we are talking of bacterial uh, isolates. And uh, whether there is any role of this phylosphere variation in terms of blast resistant genes that can be separated in terms of the blast resistance per se that is present there because of PIE2 and PIE54. So that part, uh, I mean, the rationale of taking a resistant susceptible genotypes and then, you know, concluding the your results in relation to that, I want a pinpoint uh, answer on that. Hello? Yes, yeah, can you? I, I am done. My, are you clear okay, about sir. my question? Sir, second question, I am not clear, sir. Exactly what uh, means? The first question is uh, apportioning yeah, the phylosphere into different components. Yes, sir. Second question is that uh, 1602 is a near isogenic line of yes, PR78 with two genes uh, for blast resistance. How resistance to blast with PIZ5 and PI54 is associated with phylosphere variation? Does it have any relationship? If it doesn't have, what was the rationale of taking a blast resistant and a blast susceptible genotype? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for this question. Actually, I have analyzed the uh, leaf phy uh, phylosphere, means only leaf I have taken, uh, not the flower or panicle, only leaf I have targeted. So that's not uh, phylosphere. Let us be clear. Then use the right term. If you are using okay, use, uh, using leaf alone, it is not phylosphere. Phylosphere is all above ground parts including stem, leaf, fruits, flowers, okay? So okay. you then uh, Actually, say sir, uh, leaves. is the sampling I did at 30 days. Yes, 30 days uh, uh, old plant I have taken. So at that time above ground only. So stem is also not that much mature and flower and seeds are not there. So uh, above ground part I have taken uh, at that particular stage. Regarding your second question, sir, uh, the rationale we have taking behind the don't say stem has a botanical definition. So if you say that you have taken 30 days plant sampling and stem is not there in rice, then you know that that's not uh, correct. So I mean, leaf means either you say you have taken entire plant parts. Whole, so sir, whole I have comp taken. Sir. Composite sample, yeah. You have not composite sample. Composite sample only I have taken, sir. Composite sample only I have taken above the above the soil, uh, three inch above the soil. So. Uh, so that soil contamination should not be there. And uh, regarding second question, sir, uh, taking the um, why blast resistant, the initial objective was, uh, uh, as I earlier also mentioned, to see uh, there is some phenotype differences. Uh, one is resistant, one is susceptible against the blast disease. 
a phenotypically there is difference there will be uh, internally physiological level and biochemistry level there will be some yeah, cellular differences so whether these particular things affect the uh, uh, structure or the like microbiome uh, microbes are colonizing on the rice leaf surface so whether a particular gene having some differences on the colonization of a, uh, a bacteria group of bacteria uh, that was the first so objective why why then see. why then why then blast resistant variety why not a bacterial blight resistant variety having xa13 xa21 or anything else why blast resistant variety sir uh, actually if i am targeting bacterial resistant only uh, uh, i am i'm going for microbiome uh, analysis the most of the reads will come for the uh, that particular xanthomonas oryzae oryzae only so i want to avoid that i have taken a fungal pathogen for that sir because 90% will of the reads will go for that but if there is an infection 90% of the reads will go for a zoo uh, so avoid that particular thing we have taken a uh, uh, blast blast disease resistant and susceptible maybe uh, andy kumar can uh, you know clarify sir. i'm still not very clear yes sir actually the the original idea was whether the resistant genes in general they 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 impact the microbiome that was the original uh, idea uh, he is correct partly because uh, when this uh, the, the palampur sample when we collected it is an endemic place Uh, we could see uh, there is a kind of uh, a tiny speck of blast appearing on those uh, PRR 78. So the idea was whether they uh, attract uh, the microbiome that is different from uh, PUSA 1602. So those uh, those it's a purely from academic angle only we wanted to know uh, whether the uh, the resistant genes uh, and the so called susceptible counterpart is there any microbiome difference of course we did not find any significant difference of microbiome in the post cultivar even in endemic place uh, that was so i uh, think that that answer my question uh, yes it sir. was just a hypothesis that you assume yes, that uh, blast resistant lines yes, and its counterpart may have difference like yes, the microbiome yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. second thing is the same cultivar was planted in port player that is a completely different uh, climatic zone uh, what we found was uh, uh, the genotype per se uh, there is no major uh, impact on the microbiome but the climate played an important role what we found was the microbiome of the coastal ecosystem is completely different from what he observed in palampur the himalayan mountain ecosystem so that is another major finding uh, came out of this particular work and uh, uh, that is the second part and uh, uh, the, the significant part here is uh, he could come out with a core microbiome of rice and uh, a sizable number of those genes uh, it uh, really put a lot of pressure on magnaporthy and we, he could prove the kind of magnaporthy suppression in even field trials that's going on in another uh, project right now we are collaborating with industry and now the industry is coming out with maybe a first time a microbiome based product for rice blast management basically uh, to have a alternative technology to tricyclosome that is now uh, the scanner of international you know exports and all lot of problems are there we are in the process of well, coming uh, out with this product see that, that that's of course a far faced uh, you know uh, yes, <laughs> imagination for blast management we have got very effective genes there are 103 major blast resistant genes Uh, yes. which have been deployed in the breeding program and they will confer resistance with the tricyclazole issue can be managed with blast resistant varieties yes. i think that that's the more direct approach but yes. using a microbiome to control uh, blast uh, disease in rice of course it could be for any disease uh, then uh, yes. you know we are taking for rice there should be some specific uh, you know region but it could be for control of bacterial blight also in that case or for uh, seed yes. blight Or for yes, fast sir. smart any disease, and yes, then sir. we should try to actually once the microbiome is isolated, right, most sir. of these varieties are highly susceptible to fast smart. It is susceptible to seed blight. You right, should sir. also try to explore if the microbiome could help in controlling uh, those yes. and alternative strategies, yes. but exactly. effective strategy yes. because yes, yes, genic, genic resistance is of course. You see, yes, PI nine in case of blast provides absolute resistance. There is no problem. Yes, so, yes, if one has to take a option to spray microbiome culture uh, for management of blast and use a resistant variety, a farmer would prefer to go for resistant variety than spraying. Uh, that will have its own implications. Absolutely, sir. I fully agree with you. But the observation what we are finding right now in the open field 
there is a flag leaf expansion is going on that is another that is adding to the yield component so that the way we are consolidating the data now multi location trial uh, it's going on in the entire many places we have already conducted 36 of them and this is one significant finding it is coming out sir the yield enhancement is right from 12 to 15% we are getting yes sir thank you so that could have some other growth promoting uh, Sure, uh, sir. effect exactly. which we do not know that has to yes, characterize it better. Yes, sir. sir. One more thing, sir. Uh, we, they are also taking observations for other food diseases. Done. 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 Done and i am happy that uh, we are moving little bit maybe successful may not be successful but non chemical control of uh, diseases and pests we may agree or may not agree in spite of the fact that not much pesticide is used in wheat and uh, in fact green revolution when when, when they say uh, attack it machete first uh, chemical which are used in rice was machete 1975 the other pesticide came later on but still it is a fact that agriculture such i am talking about pg not ira we went for chemical control of pest and diseases because that was easier that way the objectives of the breeders got narrowed down but yes, now it is a high time that we move so that way i appreciate it wonderful now coming to your work i wonder about uh, selection of uh, to so diverse environments when you select those then how genotype you fact uh, you expect fact of genotypes so diverse what to say of uh, andaman nicobar as director and we are went many times to north east chilong where we have a research station by the time my colleagues used to come to office i used to feel tired because i was get up at sunshine see katak versus punjab even cow height is less when we have such diverse environment how is the adaptation of the genotypes which you are studying studying and if adaptation is not good if we are weak then we get more diseases and pests everything will change i i don't know how it is in plant pathology or in bacterial population am i i remember i am old person so remember only old things 1965 genetics paper by Moll et al. Norm University and his that paper the conclusion was that there is optimum level of diversity. So here again, once we study the population environment to which we want to correlate our results, it should be optimal, a little bit more than optimal, something like that. I don't know, but I'm really it is expected and surprised that so much variation biodiversity in microbial population it, it is expected palampore ecosystem entirely different than there but then at both places this is the question why well, bentova is most popular most prevalent bentova yes sir bentova, bentova is most and yes, any sir, reason yes, for that any reason for that actually sir pentoa has been reported as the most dominant phylosphere adopted bacteria on a uh, many crops rice wheat maize soybean and pentoa is sir ubiquitous in uh, niche and uh, it is uh, in dominant proportion also reason any chance sir, of, is, a, a, any chance of it to become a pathogenic yes sir it is uh, opportunistic pathogen also so then it is opportunistic pathogen but uh, uh, it is a one of the most dominant micro uh, means bacteria on phylosphere irrespective of the crop sir you, you and said reason that maybe it, sir it is it, it, it has been patented it for use in apple you said that also yeah yeah pentova vegans uh, strain c9 has been uh, already registered uh, in apple which is isolated from apple actually sir <laughs> there is uh, we know that aspergillus niger sir which is a pathogen of groundnut but also registered as calicena as a biocontrol agent in uh, our same division so is calicena sir as no, no, in fact, in fact, there is a lot of variation within within species yes, also sir, strain level that, that's not are there, there than dr ak saying or myself would not done anything within species also there is a lot of variation but yes, still sir, it is interesting that uh, at both the places so much of diversity is there but still one 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tani, we have already we have spent a lot of time. I have only one suggestion to yes, sir. the faculty that it will be interesting to know, uh, know because the new pathotype appear very fast. So, is this biome or bacteria population also changing that fast, or it is it is slower? So, if you started working on this thing, then maybe only at Palampur at one place. How how over time? How what is temporal evolution Changes. in bacterial population or maybe fungi also, if it is possible? I don't know. I I I, I don't know much about this type of work. Yeah, please. Sir, Thank you. Uh, I uh, shall I tell something, sir, regarding this question? I had a suggestion, not question. Uh, suggestion, yeah. Suggestion. Oh, sorry. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next presentation, which is uh, by Miss Uma Prajapati from the discipline of post harvest technology. Honorable chairperson of the session, respected jury members, distinguished scientists, and gathering, welcome to one and all in the merit merit presentation. Let me begin with saying by Richard Pody, poor eating habits developed at early age leads to lifetime of real health consequences. Stressful work pressure and lazy lifestyle leads to unhealthy eating habit, which results in several lifestyle disorders such as CVD, diabetes, cancer. It is said that one out of 11 people have diabetes in the world and India's diabetic population is 42% according to ICMR. Thus, consuming healthy diets such as bitter gourd and its recipe could lower the occurrence of lifestyle disorders. Now, why bitter gourd? Because in developing countries like India, herbal medicine always played an important role in human health. And after COVID-19 pandemic, people became more conscious about healthy diet. Due to many pharmacological benefits, anti-diabetic potential, and several bad activities, bitter gourd is considered as healthy food. Major health beneficial components in bitter gourd are phenol, saponin, momodicin, and charentine. Bitter gourd is cultivated in 96,000 hectare area of India with 10 lakh million ton of total production. It is produced in different states of India with maximum share under Chhattisgarh and is exported in Dubai, UAE, Qatar. Post-harvest losses in bitter gourd is 25% due to which farmers are able to sell 40% of their produce and the reasons are lack of proper post-harvest management practices. Post-harvest losses in bitter gourd are due to moisture loss, yellowing, microbial spoilage, seed hardness and lycopene development in the arils. Due to which shelf life is only 4 to 5 days under ambient condition. Post harvest treatments such as edible coating, 1 MCP, modified atmospheric packaging were utilized so far. But grass chemicals and green technology were not explored for shelf life enhancement of better guard till now. Considering this gap in mind, we propose the thesis on the topic studies on the influence of UVC and chemical elisters on quality and shelf life of better guard fruits. With the three main objectives. First was standardization of UVC radiation for microbial load reduction and quality retention of bitter gourd foods. Second was extension of storage life of bitter gourd foods using chemical elisters. And third was expression of key gene responsible for charentine biosynthesis during storage of bitter gourd foods. This is the outline of my research work showing different treatment at different concentration for bitter gourd shelf life extension. For the first objective, UVC was selected. Now, why UVC? Because it is non-thermal, germicidal, eco-friendly, lethal and easy to apply. For this, male and female flowers were fused to form foods which were harvested after 16 days of pollination and treated with UVC 20, 30 and 40 minutes. Thereafter, it was stored at 10 degrees Celsius for 16 days. This is how the UVC chamber was prepared and the foods were rotated in between the treatments. Results showed that 1.54 lower weight loss and Six-fold higher fruit firmness retention in UVC 40-minute treated bitter gourd on 16th day of storage. Biochemical attributes such as total phenol was 2.3-fold higher and total antioxidant was 1.5-fold higher in UVC 40-minute treatment. UVC induced production of stress-related metabolites such as MDA and proline. UVC 40-minute increased 46% higher MDA and 80% higher proline on 16th day of storage. Antidiabetic potential was due to inhibition of alpha myelase and alpha glucosidase enzyme responsible for breaking of polysaccharides. 37% higher alpha myelase inhibition and 52% higher alpha glucosidase inhibition was reported in UVC 40 minute treated bitter gourd. Saponin also possesses anti diabetic properties and HPLC results showed 6% higher saponin in UVC 40 minute treated bitter gourd on 16 day of storage. 
This is the chromatogram of saponin with RT 4.4 minute. Total microbial count was 50% reduced in UVC 40 minute treated bitter gut compared to control. Thus, UVC increased the quality and shelf life of bitter gut by altering the cell wall degrading enzyme, increasing the secondary metabolite production by intense related enzymes. Thus, for the first objective, it can be concluded that UVC 40 minute could extend the shelf life of bitter gut for 16 days with higher retention of total phenols, antioxidant, saponin, and by the reduction of total microbial count. Second objective was composed of three experiments where chemicals such as salicylic acid, putrescine, and calcium lactate were taken to extend the shelf life of bitter gut fruit. This is how the treatment was given, and the dipping time for each treatment was 15 minutes with 20 storage days. Results showed that salicylic acid 10 millimolar reduced the weight loss of bitter gut to 33% and retained 45% higher firmness on 20th day of storage compared to control. Total phenol and antioxidant activity reduced with increased storage duration, but salicylic acid 10 millimolar retained two-fold higher total phenols and 2.5-fold higher antioxidant on 28th day of storage. Alpha amylase and alpha glucosidase was higher in all the treatments on 28th day of storage with 21% higher alpha amylase and 78% higher alpha glucosidase inhibition in salicylic acid 10 millimolar treated bitter guard compared to control. 15% higher saponin content was recorded on 15 day of storage in salicylic acid 10 millimolar dose compared to control. The salicylic acid affected the bitter gut shelf life by modulating cell wall degrading enzymes such as polygalactouranase and reducing the weight loss. It increased the antioxidant and phenolics by activation of ROS avoidance system. Hence, it can be concluded that salicylic acid 10 millimolar extends the shelf life of bitter gut for 20 days with higher retention of phenols, antioxidant, and saponin. Results from the second experiment showed twofold lower weight loss and Two-fold higher food firmness retention in putrescin 3 millimolar treated bitter gut compared to control. Putrescin 2 millimolar affected the total phenol by increasing it to 40% and putrescin 3 millimolar increased antioxidant to 30% on 28th day of storage compared to control. Putrescin 3 millimolar retained 16% higher alpha amylase and 35% higher alpha glucosidase inhibition on 28th day. Putrescin 3 millimolar also retained 4% higher saponin content compared to control on 20th day of storage. The exogenous application of putrescin could extend the shelf life of bitter gut through increased food firmness and increased phytonutrient accumulation by modulation of antioxidant system and also by reducing the ethylene by diversifying its pathway. in 3 millimolar extend the shelf life of bitter gut with retaining higher antioxidant and saponins on 20th day of storage. In the third experiment, calcium lactate 100 millimolar effectively reduced the weight loss of bitter gut to 40% and 2.7 fold higher firmness retention on 28th day of storage. 43% higher total phenols and 90% higher antioxidant activity along with 1.5 fold higher alpha amylase and 2.2 fold higher alpha glucosidase inhibition was reported in calcium lactate 100 millimolar treated bitter gut compared to control. Calcium lactate 100 millimolar also retained 7% higher saponin on 28th day of storage. The mechanism showed that calcium application triggers calcium sensors, which initiates the physiological response by reducing the respiration and softening. Also, it interacts with plant cell and protects the leakage of phytonutrients from cell during storage, thus maintaining quality and increasing the shelf life. And calcium lactate 100 millimolar effectively increased the bitter gut shelf life to 20 days with maximum retention of antidiabetic potential, saponin, and phenols. In the third objective, firstly, the charentine was quantified through HPLC and then subjected to gene expression study. Charentine is basically a white crystalline compound found in bitter gut known for its anti-diabetic potential. This is the chromatogram of charentine showing RT at 9.5 minutes. HPLC results showed higher charentine retention in UVC 40 minutes, salicylic acid 10 millimolar, putrescin 3 millimolar, and calcium lactate 100 millimolar treated bitter gut. Of all the treatment, putrescin 3 millimolar was most effective in retaining higher charentine at a 722 microgram on 28th day of storage. 
In order to support the result of HPLC, we moved a step forward and did molecular study by taking two genes responsible for charentine biosynthesis, that is MACSI and MACAS. For that, Bittergard was treated with putrecin as it was having high charentine and RNA was extracted, cDNA was synthesized and then subjected to qualitative RT-PCR. Results were analyzed by double delta CT method. It showed that MACSI and MACAS gene was upregulated in untreated Bittergard on 28 day of storage while putrecin treatment downregulated the expression. Reduced expression of these genes as a result of putrecin treatment could be due to involvement of some other factors in charentine biosynthesis. It can be concluded that putrecin 3 millimolar retained higher charentine with lower expression of gene responsible for its synthesis. So the salient findings of our study was UVC 40 minute increased the shelf life of bitter guard to 16 days with high retention of biochemical attributes, salicylic acid 10 millimolar, putrecin 3 millimolar and calcium lactate 100 millimolar also extended the shelf life of bitter guard to 20 days with higher retention of total phenols antioxidant saponin. Charentine was higher in putrecin 3 millimolar dose and gene expression of maxi and macas was lower under its storage. Of all the treatment, putrecin 3 millimolar was best for retaining the biochemical property and increasing the shelf life of bitter guard. Practically for farmers, green technology and grass chemical could reduce the post-harvest loss and increase their income. For consumer point of view, it will retain high anti-diabetic potential and nutraceutical attributes which will reduce the lifestyle disorder. Further, there is need to combine the green technology and grass chemicals with no residual effect and there is need to study the gene responsible for charentine biosynthesis in temporal or spatial domain. Some of my findings from the study has been published in high impact journal, one has been published in food packaging and shelf life with impact factor of 6.42, other has been published in physiology and molecular biology of plants with impact factor of 2.41. One of my research paper is communicated in IJS. And these are some of my other publication during my PhD tenure. The work has also been presented in many national and international conferences. I also received best oral presentation award in international conference on innovative research in agriculture. Apart from that, I also served as BUS student representative in division of food science and post harvest technology during my PhD tenure. Now I take the opportunity to thank one and all with special mention to my chairperson and advisory committee, Division of Food Science and Post Harvest Technology, other sister divisions, PhD school IRI, my family and friends. To conclude, I would like to say green post harvest solution protect not just the fresh produce, but also humankind. In this regard, this is my humble contribution towards the sustainable development goal. Thank you so much for your patience listening. May I now invite Dr. Bansal for the comments? <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good is raising hands anyway. I, I will do it. So anyway, Ms. Uma, I think uh, yes, I thought you were looking for a solution and you, are, you have got here so many solutions of a problem already, you know. But, uh, uh, ultraviolet C radiation, you've got, you know, three different kinds of chemicals and, you know, and everything is increasing shelf life and in increasing the, the post harvest quality parameters as well in bitter guard. So was it so easy? Why it was not attempted before by anyone else? No, sir. In bitter guard, it was not attempted by anyone else before. So UVC and such of these chemicals have been reported to extend the shelf life or quality of other fruit, fruits and, or vegetables? Yes, sir. Uh, so it has been earlier used for extension of the tomato shelf life, broccoli, uh, UV is uh, utilized in many places. Like they are also uh, making the structures, chambers for increasing the shelf life through the UVC treatment. And um, of course, important is expected from student again from IRI. Sorry to be critical always. Um, you know, that uh, out of all these, I thought you could have also done kind of an economic analysis that which one tomorrow is. <laughs> You know, which is the best approach from the profit point of view or affordability by, by the farmers or the growers and also to their impact on the environment themselves. Like, for example, you were talking of UVC will reduce the microbial load, right? Yes, sir. So on the other hand, you know, previous presentation, somebody is trying to increase the microbial load 
Uh, and so uh, here, uh, you know, what was the role of these microbes that you were trying to reduce through UVC treatment? Can you please tell us more about it? Yes, sir. Uh, total bacterial as well as total fungal count. Uh, no. What were those causing? Any problem to the bitter god? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, there is a problem of aspergillus as well as pseudomonas. Okay. Uh, due to which uh, the fruit rotting occurs. That's why we have given UVC treatment. And sir, regarding economic analysis, uh, sir, may I speak? Am yes, I audible, please. sir? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir, regarding, yes, sir. Regarding economic analysis, uh, people are using uh, UVC, UVC chambers, like uh, in the pack house, uh, they are using uh, UVC treatment, UVC uh, light they are installing, and then they are switching on the light according to the fruit and vegetable requirement, and uh, they are giving treatments and they are getting good results also, sir. Any any sort of ill effects of any of these treatments, if anybody has reported in the literature, though you have not studied, yes. it appears, but I'm sure there must be some ill effects of these chemicals or even UV radiation. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I also tried as a preliminary trial. Uh, I have given UVC 40, 40 minutes is maximum, which I have shown. But I have also given UVC uh, 80 minutes and 60 minutes. But in 60 minutes, the food uh, skin or the food flesh was uh, like uh, dried. Means it was started drying and the chlorophyll was also reducing. And also it has been reported by some other scientists, uh, research scholars like UV, uh, UVC have reduced after uh, means heavy treatment. After so much high treatment, the UVC has reduced the shelf life and uh, reduced the, if, if it's not uh, used at a safe level. So it is also causing harmful effect to the fruits also. Okay. It is so, at a high level. Yes, sir. Right. So, so different treatments, you know, have to the extension of shelf life and also improve quality, certain parameters. So yes, you think sir. there's something common mechanism that which we can then try to decipher from your research. You know, then we can try to control that mechanism in an innovative way, which is more, you, you know, environmental friendly or user friendly. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, there is a mechanism called as elicitation. Elicitation means using of uh, some elicitors like uh, hot water treatment, UVC treatment, means surgical elicitors as well as chemical elicitors, giving some stress to the uh, produce so that it will release more metabolites. It will, uh, it will protect itself and it will release more phenols, antioxidants. Excuse me. No, no. From your analysis, from your PhD work only I'm talking about, you gave different treatments including UVC was there any single mechanism you came across which was responsible let's say for example leave aside from the bacterial load leave aside improved quality parameters for extending the shelf life because that's what we started with you know yes, so sir. In the shelf life was there any single mechanism you were struck you know any which was common among different treatments you given and that mechanism as a scientist I thought you would then decipher details into it more you know uh, yes, into Three, where you, you, I think, have gone a little bit. I have one more question after this. So, could you come across a particular mechanism which is responsible for increasing shelf life in bitter god out of your treat different treatments? Yes, sir. It's strengthening of cell wall. Strengthening of cell wall. It is basically um, modulating uh, the, the cell wall due to which uh, it is reducing the ethylene. And ethylene is the main enzyme which is responsible for uh, reducing the shelf life of uh, majority of the fruits and vegetables as with regard to climatic food. So uh, it is basically targeting that that one thing and uh, the, the, uh, just increasing the shelf life. You are giving this information from the literature because you did not measure any of the enzyme activity or the gene expression related to ethylene biosynthesis pathway. And, and yes, you did, of course, firmness that, that I understand. So that was expected actually of a student you know, you give a treatment and parameters going up and down, but I think from a science perspective, we would like yes, to sir. deep into the analysis part of it, you know, so that your journal, you know, so that goes even further up in, in the impact factor. Anyway, and what is this charentinin? I am not aware charentin. of it. What is yes, this? Sir, and what's uh, this role? Yeah. Charentin is a, uh, is a type of saponin, steroidal saponin which is responsible for anti-diabetic properties of bitter gall. So, and why did you study these two genes then when, 
Uh, are the genes reported in literature responsible for biosynthesis of this compound? So there is a single paper, only single paper, which showed the uh, um, biosynthesis pathway of charantin. So from so how that many, paper, how many, enzymes, how many enzymes are involved? So two. And so these apoxidase and cycloartenol synthase. And you found the expression was not uh, upregulated. Sir, yes, sir. Because that was under fresh, fresh fruit condition, and we tried for stored fruit condition. So that was we a tried. all together because you were talking of post harvest processing quality, but you your focus was not making it anti diabetic, right? Of the thesis. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, actually, I wanted to see whether uh, if my serotonin is increasing through HPLC, whether it it will increase through. Uh, molecular uh, mechanism is also showing some increase on no, but the, yeah, this, yes, the third objective did not fit your original plan of work. So sometimes yes, I can, sir. student will try to extend, you know, rather than going deep into it, they spread horizontally. But I think I would have more deeper analysis, you know, whether biochemical or molecular from a student of IR and PhD. But very good work, otherwise, very important um, from so the point of view or from increasing shelf life of very important, you know. Material we're talking with regard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Can we now have questions from Dr. Patil? <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you, Uma. Uh, it's a nice presentation. <clears throat> but uh, as uh, you are aware that the fruits and vegetables are highly perishable and uh, it needs to be attempted to increase the shelf life. Uh, as I also agree with Dr. Bansal, because this is a PhD thesis, and uh, there is uh, no any economic part, economics of the complete treatment is totally missing. Actually, farmers or expert ho export houses and other traders must know the economics of this treatment. Actually, that is actually a missing. I fully agree with Dr. Bansar. <clears throat> then uh, the standardization of the UVC radiation exposure to the fruit, uh, you have given 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, but in the presentation, uh, and you have uh, shown that 40 minutes exposure is the best one. Uh, but during the, uh, giving the answer to Dr. Bansal's question, you have uh, gone again for 60 minutes and 80 minutes, but nowhere I paid in your presentation. So actually they should have been given so that uh, it, uh, like us, it should have been told to us because of uh, more exposure, the <coughs> quality of the, uh, that, uh, bitter guard is uh, spoiling and uh, there is no increase in the shelf life. So it is a 40 minutes. So it should have been given. Actually, then you have given <clears throat> uh, as regards to the residual lipid, then you have used the uh, salicylic acid, then uh, calcium lactate, uh, all kind of treatments. Uh, what did, did you measure the residues of this? Uh, whether uh, you have measured the residues? Uh, and what is the shape level of the residues, whether it is adverse effect on the export. Uh, that is because if you are exporting, because this is having a very high export value, bitter guard nowadays in, in uh, Arab countries and all these things, we are exporting uh, bitter guard a lot from Maharashtra, so we are exporting from Mumbai. So there is a residue um, uh, uh, calculation should be uh, there, whether you have uh, measured. Can can you answer this? <clears throat> oh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we haven't measured the uh, residual calculation, but mm. uh, the residual limit is very, means we are using very small concentration of salicylic acid, putrosine and calcium lactate. And for uh, like salicylic acid and calcium lactate and putrosine, these are graph chemicals that is generally recognized as safe. And the concentration, base concentration for its utilization and causing harm to the human body is very high. And we are we are just using uh, 10 millimolar. That is too much less mm. uh, in mg. In but but the uh, but I will tell you that uh, putrescine concentration six to eight mg per kg of body weight. That is that is too much low. And also salicylic acid three uh, percent. Uh, calcium lactate 2500 mg per um, kg body weight so we have used uh, the limit at safety level sir uh, what about economic yes. Yes, sir. Uh, process you have not answered 
Actually, sir, uh, regarding economics, economics I haven't mentioned in the slide, but we have calculated that, and we found that, uh, like for one kg of fruit crop, one kg of fruit crop, the cost is 0.2 to 0.5, only 0.2 to 0.5 each kg. Uh, so the farmer, if we, if they will treat like 100 kg of produce in 100 liter of water, and they they can again like again and again they can. Feed the fruit in the same water, so uh, there could be increment of shelf life also, and the economy will increase if the shelf life is also increasing. So uh, we have calculated, sir. And uh, yeah. regarding UV, UV is one-time installation. It is cost-effective, sir. No, then finally, which we, which you are going to recommend, whether UVC radiation or other chemical methods. Sir, if cost cost point of view or combination think, combination of UV C radiation and other okay. sir um, for the future prospect I I myself want to study the combination effect of both treatments if the UV separately and the salicylic acid separately is increasing the shelf life so both can also increase the shelf life too much extent so uh, uh, regarding the question UV UV is more cost effective as uh, in comparison to other treatments. Because it is one-time installation, you have to just stall in pre-cooling chamber or pack house and switch on the light for the recommended, that is the recommended dose for different fruits and vegetables. They are recommending the dose. So I think that will work, sir. And uh, UV is cost-effective, more cost-effective than other chemicals. But other chemicals are also not that much expensive. No, but ease of operation is also very important. No? Ease of treatment is also very important. Yes, so yes, you are getting the uh, results from the chemical treatments. Uh, yes, sir. Case, if you are getting any UV C radiation, then you should recommend that only. You know why farmers are so much confused about this? Uh, sir, I, I have done. Huh? Okay. So we'll quickly okay. have one question from uh, Dr. Man Singh, and uh, then we can have the comments from the chairperson. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dhoja. It's not a question. I just wanted to look at the positive of this particular presentation, if I'm permitted, Mr. Chairman, sir. Please, please. Uh, please. I enjoyed her presentation uh, because when we observed from slide number one to two, her slides were free from cloud. Each slide has only one illustration. And also her narration was in the line of what Mr. Chairman mentioned, that it should be like a storytelling. I'm not getting into the technicalities. The other part when she was being asked questions by uh, Honorable Experts, Dr. Bansal and Dr. Patil, she was very confident. The one point which I would like to very respectfully submit that Professor Bansal also had been professor for several years. A student's ORW is cleared from Board of Studies, from the faculty, from the dean, and on that they work. So economic question may be the, in the future, other students can think from this discussion, but whatever objective was approved, probably she is answerable to that only. That's my submission. I'm Once sorry. again, I compliment, I do not know the student, but I sorry. compliment her. Sorry to yeah. say, Dr. Man Singh, I beg to differ with you because we are not dependent it's on... Okay. No, no, we are not dependent as a PhD student only on what we have been asked. We have to be using our own analysis as an yeah. intelligent mind. We, yeah. have, we have already mastered through MSc, you know, yeah. 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 So I would expect that even student to take a proactive role, even if she or he has not been advised. And we have done that in our own times, by Dr. the way. Dr. Dr. Vansu. I, I mean, sir, I mean, we are yeah, not, let, us, let, us not, let us not discuss further. It's an intellectual Dr. Mansi, osmosis, yeah. Dr. Mansi, Dr. Yeah, Mansi, yeah, we, 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 we value your uh, to Dr. Mansal and other jury members that we have not heard what you have said. Because uh, our objective is entirely different. Not simply identifying. Our objective is how to do better. Simple. That is why uh, Dr. Marcel said today, I said yesterday, if you are uh, present, uh, that if quality member is there, that is the reason I used the word today also, just a
here we are not simply to select the of course whatever student has done and let me i think i used this sentence yesterday economics is very very important and today it's, uh, i said i think i said that i sometimes feel that i should have studied economics rather than genetics and plant breeding it is very very important but to use of any technology the expenses come down once it is adopted at the moment what my colleagues may be expecting just a rough idea just in, in fact all these questions which have been written uh, which have been answered i have written this year for example uv whether it should be at farm gate or it should be at pack house or it should be at household level so these question do come to mind and we don't expect from a student uh, from uh, in the beginning itself and technology who who thought uh, that year earlier that we will have so cheap uh, uh, electronics etc etc so we have not heard you <laughs> no, dr mansur don't worry i no, think no no i i take it everything is sporting because yeah, it yeah. came to my mind so i thought of putting in a logical manner that's all i happy was to not intended to Uh, you, my, you 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 will not be happy to learn my uh, to uh, know my, my 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 response. I mean, uh, to what yeah. Dr. Prajapati presentation. I was surprised everywhere. Very good, very good, very good. Starting with shelf life, I'm doing value addition. So I have written here, Dr. Mansal plus 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 everywhere. But I have tried. Then she gave the answer that everything I have been tried on other things, but because. Uh, this bitter gourd or krela is independent. Uh, uh, it is more grown. Talk of PAU. They are working on corn fruits. I said, "What is this nonsense? You start working on another thing. What is Indian?" And the result of we came up with the bottling of a sugar cane juice. Did anybody think of it? No. And in case of um, machinery, I always say, please go to US or other country. See which machine was being used twenty years earlier. we are behind them what our i saw at university of hohenheim very good in mechanical engineering india when i went there first time so we again i am sorry if somebody feels but whatever i feel i say very good repeaters and poor thinkers so whatever someone else has done outside we repeat same thing on again potato again potato pom fries those of the uh findings or information available for our product so that way i am happy it may not look that much sense, uh, scientific but that is also very useful to the society krela or bitter gourd is emerging as an important crop it is uh, important from the anglo diabetes even in india what to save export but at the same time uh, <laughs> everything was positive but uh, dr parjapati explained that but let uh, uh, one question if there is strength then the quality should go down sir so, uh, stability should go down no, sir so, could you please repeat the question you have to repeat the question please, please. Yes, sir. It, it is not clear. No, sir. Now okay, it is. Okay. Now it is clear, repeat? sir. Okay, okay. I will yes, maybe I, I was late. If uh, with the treatment of you, you said that cell wall is strengthened. Yes, sir. That should have adverse effect on digestibility and availability of the contents. I mean, the chemicals. No, sir. Did sir, you do? Uh, did for, you do some? Did that, you do? Did you do some experiments? For that, I have answer. Uh, I haven't done any experiment regarding this, like uh, uh, calculation of calcium content in the uh, treated bitter gourd. But I have answer for that. Uh, if we would uh, treat, if if there is more calcium, because strengthening of cell wall is due to calcium, calcium and other uh, enzymes like pectin methylesterase reduction, oligalactoureases. If these enzymes are playing little role and uh, calcium uh, is impacting all the cell wall and all these things. Then those those those, study, those those studies have been done in which crop, in which uh, fruit or uh, vegetable, which you are quoting, because you uh, didn't study. Yes, sir. So, uh, sir, which... sir, tomato. So majority of the work has been done in tomato, sir. So then, what is the value of your research if everything as such is applicable? 
Again, uh, we are to improve here, not to discourage you. No, 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 no uh, sir. No. It's okay, sir. Sir, I have to just answer the question, sir. No, you are taking help of whatever is published and applicable in other crops. Yes, sir. Very good. Yes, but sir. science is zero equal to zero has to be proven. That is science. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And when there is some some strengthening of cell wall, it will affect digestibility. Why not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It will affect bioavailability. Yes, sir. And then then combination of two, you said you didn't do it. That was would have been very good if you had combined the yes, effect sir. of her. Anyway, you, you explained the mechanism of calcium, but again, this question was answered that in other cases, you didn't explain the protein. Don't take shelter that we are applying only a little bit of. How much, how many uh, tablets do we eat? That is also chemical. And we see even, I, I today it's how I presented data, but I have counter question on that data that, okay, there is degradation or breakup of the pesticides. Again, we get some another chemical yes, once sir. it's broken. And what is the fact of that? Yes, that chemical on human body, has anybody studied? No, so sir. better is to go broken, by sir. nature as far as possible. Okay. But, but that is not possible all the time. We have to take care of food and nutrition security of an increasing population and increasing livelihood. We cannot say to farmers, you all the time grow organic farming, whether you get one rupee or two rupee or three rupee. If he is accustomed to have 70 quintals of rice, he will grow 70 quintals of rice. He will not go to pigeon pea or mung bean because there are many questions in the chat box. They, my colleagues don't know what is the yield level of the, uh, and these uh, uh, pulses, which, which are to compete with the... We have to consider uh, season-wise. They, they, they don't know stability of performance. All the pulses sometimes go give zero performance. Most stable crop in Punjab is rice. Yes, sir. If they, I'm just talking about other things. Uh, some, oh, some points are there. Side. Yeah. If, if, if there is a, a drought at India level, the yield goes down. But in Punjab, drought here have more yield, uh, more yield, higher yield, because it is already uh, irrigated. All irrigation sources are devoted to that, and because of no clouds, there is more better photosynthesis. So don't let us not try to just then then there is no value. You say that this is in tomato, this is you say that I have not done it may be possible, but I have not done it. One of my teachers, Dr. Ek Singh, you may be known Dr. K B Singh of Pulses, who worked at Kirisat and uh, then in uh, uh, Lopo, Ekarda. No, AK is not there. Anyway. I, I know, sir, I am there, I am there. Uh, so know. you know him? You know him? Yes, yes, yes. He taught me five zero one plant breeding, and a midterm examination. He kept my answer sheet, and uh, at the end, and uh, I thought something is wrong, and at the end he said, "Baldeo." He never called me Baldeo. Baldeo, get up. I, I stood up. I have not given you fifteen marks. You deserve that. I have given you fourteen nine marks, because you gave absolute statement in biological sciences. So, Bete, Doctor Parjapati. Don't give such absolute, which I am not. Okay. I got many times negative results. So all the best. Very good. Thank you but so uh, whatever in your mind, please, uh, this is again the next student who is going to come that uh, he or she should uh, take up the points which have been mentioned. Very relevant points by Dr. Uh, Bansal and Dr. Pa Patra Saab. Economist Whenever we come to new technology, a little bit of knowledge the student should have. A little bit, some. That, okay, we tried, we discussed it. We are sensitive to that thing. And uh, Dr. Man Singh, BOS, we people are there, Board of Studies. And again, we are also a biological system. We are not uh, human, uh, we are human beings, not God. So we can commit yeah. mistake. We can commit mistake. And let me tell you, the seriousness which is in our system 20, 30, 40 years earlier, it is not at, at PEU. I don't know about IR. Anyway, let us move on. Thank you, sir. So, with so this... I think I, I made Dr. Mansing happy and Dr. Bansal also happy. <laughs> no, sir. We, we, were, we were very close friends since 88 when he was a student, PhD students in WTC. So we know each other for quite long. So no issue. Yeah, please. 
so with this we reach to the last presentation of the day uh, which is to be made by siddharthut maragal from the division of vegetable science can we have the presentation please dr bhavan a very good evening to all i am siddharthut maragal phd scholar division of vegetable science welcoming you all for my merit medal presentation Watermelon is an important crop of India. In the recent year, due to its nutritional values and the adaptation of advanced cultural technology, the farmers made the watermelon crop up somewhat to year round. However, in the recent days, year end production of watermelon is constrained by a thrice transmitted viral disease that is watermelon bud necrosis virus, estimated to cause yield loss of 60 to 100 percent. For a control, being a salad crop, pesticide spray is not advisable. Hence, cultivation of resistant varieties is an eco-friendly option. However, till date, not a single variety is resistant to agnid disease. Hence, in this direction, at IIT Bangalore, we have initiated resistant variety development program. For this, we have screened more than 300 exceptions and found resistance in two wild species, namely Citrus samaras and Citrus colocynthes. By using Citrus samaras one of the species, we have developed more than 300 pre-bred lines. Among the 300 pre-bred lines, four lines have found most consistent for W resistance can be used for W in breeding program, but still being wild in a form using them in resistant breeding food quality is a major concern. Hence, understanding genetics and mapping of fruit culture in the wild background, simultaneously mapping and transfer of resistant genes into the cultivated background is the need of the hour. With this background, my research work was carried with the title "Joint Multiple Family Linkage Analysis for Resistant to Watermelon Bud Necrosis Virus and Fruit Culture Traits in Watermelon." With the following objectives: first, one to understand the genetics of Indian adults of fruit culture traits, to develop and characterize the nested association mapping population for W N resistance and fruit culture traits in watermelon. to perform joint multiple family linkage analysis for w1 resistant and fruit color traits in watermelon coming to the first experiment genetics of fruit color traits in the pre-bred lines derived from citrus samaras for this we used two pre-bred lines namely bill 53 and bill 99 and cross the common ice box type elite inbred line and developed f2 bc1 and bc2 population for genetic study where bill 53 was characterized by white flesh red seed 5 to 6% tss medium green stripe whereas bill 99 was characterized by canary yellow flesh tan seed 6 to 7% tss and light green stripe whereas ih140 was characterized by dark red flesh black seed and 11 to 13% tss and dark green stripe Coming to the results, for seed coat color, we identified single gene in the tans, where black color was dominant over red and tan seed colors. Similarly, for red traits, we followed EPO guidelines for their characterization, where darkest region we considered the stripe and between region is the interstripe. Genetic analysis of stripe pattern suggested a single gene in the tans, where solid stripe was dominant over marble stripe and gray stripe. Similarly, for stripe color, we identified single gene in the tans, where dark green was dominant over medium and light green. For interstep pattern, we identified single gene in the tans in first cross and two gene in the tans second cross with duplicate gene action. For stripe color, we identified single gene in the tans, where green was dominant over yellowish white and light green. And for the fruit shape genetics, we calculated the fruit shape index and developed the fruit shape scale ranging from flat to oblong. Results suggested polygenic inheritance for the cross flat into oblong, whereas single gene inheritance with the codominant gene action was reported in the cross round into oblong. For the flesh color, we observed region or tissue specific segregation in the segregating population. Hence, we are the first to pin out the flesh color at four regions, namely at center, margin, around the seeds, and inside the carpal region. Results suggested polygenic inheritance of the flesh color at the center of the fruit. Similarly, at the margin, we observed two gene inheritance in the first cross, whereas single gene inheritance in the second cross, where red was dominant over yellow. Similar for flesh color around the seeds, in the both the crosses, we observed digenic inheritance with various epistatic gene action. And for color at the carpal region, we observed digenic inheritance in the first cross and single gene inheritance in the second cross, where red was dominant over yellow. And for the TSS, results suggested the polygenic inheritance in the both the crosses. For the sixth generation bean analysis, revealed the duplicate epistatis. Coming to experiment number two, cutel mapping for fruit color traits in the pre-bred lines derived from Citrus samaras. For this, we used the 81 BC1 F2 mapping population derived from the cross Bill 53 to IH140. Around 200 polymorphic markers were used for construction of linkage mapping and cutel analysis. Cutel with more than three LOD we considered as a major cutel. Coming to the results, for seed coat color, we identified three major cutels on chromosome three and five with the highest PV of 49%. Similarly, for seed size, two cutels were detected on chromosome two with the highest PV of 37%. Candidate gene analysis identified in validated gene CL9301 on chromosome two as a candidate of seed size. Similarly, CL9481 gene on chromosome three identified as a candidate for black seed coat color. Finally, we developed a novel PCR-based marker for black and red seed coat color of watermelon. For the rind-related traits, we detected eight cutels on chromosome nine. 
based on sentinel analysis with muscle and summer squash and cucumber genome we predicted cla614 at as a candidate gene for red color sequence analysis of parents with two reference genome detected three bsp deletion in 11th exam for the dark red color translation into amino acid sequence further confirmed that deletion of one amino acid at the position of 492 result in the dark green stripe of the watermelon for the food shape we detected total of 10 qtls on chromosome 3 and 11 candidate gene ls in a qtl region on fsi we detected cla1257 as candidate gene for food shape candidate gene sequencing of parents and segregants followed by translation into amino acid sequence suggested two point mutation at the position of 113 to 65 are the cause for food shape polymorphism in watermelon and for the flesh color we are the first to map the qtls at four different regions Phenotyping by colorimetric method, we detected 12 QTLs on different chromosomes with the highest PV of 24%. Similarly, by visual phenotyping, we detected 3 QTLs with the highest PV of 20%. Candidate gene analysis in the region predicted the putative candidate genes which are involved in the carotenoid biosynthesis pathway, like jazanthin epoxidase, geranyl geranyl pyrophosphatase, lycopene beta cyclase, and carotene isomerase. In depth, we studied the lycopene beta cyclase gene on chromosome 4. Candidate gene sequencing of parents and segregants followed by translation to amino acid sequence suggested one non-synonymous point mutation <laughs> at 226 position is the cause for <laughs> candidate yellow flesh color versus red and salmonella flesh color of the watermelon. <laughs> for TSS, we detected one novel QTL on chromosome 11 with a PV of 17.80%. Coming to the third experiment, QTL mapping for resistant to watermelon bud necrosis virus. For this, we used four resistant pre-bred lines, namely Bill 4, Bill 53, Bill 19, and Bill 135. These lines are crossed with common susceptible allied iceberg type inbred line and developed four mapping populations. These populations screened under natural epipyridic condition with no mulching. In order to avoid disease escape, two susceptible checks, namely Arkamanik and NS295, used as the infector rows. These infector rows were planted 15 days in advance to to develop field inoculum. Once the inoculum are developed, we transplanted our entries. 0 to 5 disease severity scale was used to record the symptoms observed in the field. These symptoms are further confirmed by using dark elicit and RT-PCR. Dark elicit and RT-PCR results suggested the all the symptoms observed in the field were positive for the WBNV. For QTL mapping, we recorded five WBNV resistant related traits, namely percent disease index, plant survival, wine length, AUDPC, and number of foods per family. Where PDI, wine length, and survival were recorded at 10 days intervals, starting from 35 to 65 days after sowing. And for genotyping, we screened around 700 markers for parental polymorphism and found around 200 markers polymorphic for Bill 53, 22 for Bill 4, 46 for Bill 99, and 44 for Bill 135. These markers screened across the population to construct a linkage map and QTL analysis. By using three QTL mapping approaches, namely composite integral mapping in individual population, joint inclusive composite integral mapping, and QTL meta analysis. Coming to the results by composite interval mapping in Bill 53 population, we detected around 23 QTLs for different traits on chromosome 2, 3, 5, and 7 with the highest PV of 37%. In Bill 99 population, we detected around 8 QTLs on chromosome 2 with the highest PV of 17%. Similarly, in Bill 4 population, we detected one major QTL on chromosome 2 with the highest PV of 22%. Joint inclusion mapping in the population derived from Bill 99 and Bill 135 detected four major QTLs on chromosome 2 with the highest PV of 14%. Most of the QTLs detected in the current study by composite interval mapping and joint inclusive composite interval mapping. The QTLs detected in other previous studies also count to overlap one another on chromosome two, three, and seven. Hence, in order to pine map these regions, we performed QTL meta analysis by using six season data of six mapping population of the size 448. QTL meta analysis detected eight meta QTL regions on chromosome two, three, and seven. Based upon their confidence interval and number of initial QTLs, we finalized M QTL 2.1, 3.2, and 7.2 as the major QTLs for WBN resistance. Here, 17 says that M QTL 2.1 was detected 17 times for different traits across the population and seasons. Likewise, M QTL 3.2 and 7.2 detected more than 14 times. So it clearly indicated that these three M QTLs are most consistent for WBN resistance. Hence, we performed candidate gene analysis in these MQTL regions. Candidate gene analysis predicted six QTL genes. Of these three genes, three were for insect resistance and three for virus resistance. Among three insect resistance genes, two genes were coding for acid phosphatase. Recently, gene coding for acid phosphatase was reported as a candidate gene for thrips resistance in capsicum, where thrips is a major vector for capsicum chlorosis virus. Similarly, another gene was coding for ethylene responsible transcription factor, reported to confer resistance against second pest. 
Similarly, among three virus resistant genes, two genes were coding for NBSLLR. In the previous studies, these NBSLLR are reported to confer resistance against two transporters like tomato spotted wilt virus and capsicum chlorosis virus. Coming to the salient findings and conclusion to experiment 1 and 2, where the first to report region specific genetic control of flesh color, independent segregation of stripe pattern and color, novel alleles for fruit shape and rind color, PCR based marker for seed color, and probable tissue specific candidates for flesh color. In conclusion, our results suggest that breeder can use citrullosomerus in resistant breeding program without any fear of linkage drag. In the third experiment, we identified three insect and three virus resistant genes as a probable candidate for WN resistance and also identified the advanced generation WN resistance in lines with improved fruit quality traits. In conclusion, WN resistance in water might be due to the involvement of both insect and virus resistant genes. Recently, in the NVPJR, we registered Bill 53 as a source of resistance to WBNV and also licensed to two private companies, namely United Genetics and Uncle Seeds Private Limited. This clearly says that in watermelon, WBNV is a trait of commercial interest. Coming to the future line of work, the candidate genes identified for fruit quality traits can be used for marker assessment selection. Further work needs to develop high throughput RTB screening protocol for functional validation of probable candidates for WBN resistance. The deserved segregants identified in the current study can be advanced to develop alert inbuilt with WBN resistance. So far, we have published four papers in high impact journals like Science of Horticulture, 3 Biotech, U Biotech, and Indian Phytopathology, where one paper already cited six times. And two papers are currently under review, and the total impact of our work is 13.13. Coming to the extracurricular activities, I have actually participated in the cultural programs and sports meet and won several medals. And also, I have attended several symposium and training programs. Recently, I have received Best Oral Presentation Award by Karnataka State Science and Technology Academy. And also, I have been served as a board member of PJCSU and secretary of IHR Students Club during 2018 and 19. Finally, it is my pleasure to acknowledge my chairman, Dr. E. Srinivas Rao and advisory committee, director IHR Bengaluru, director and dean PG School IR and New Delhi. Finally, I conclude my presentation with the words of Nobel laureate, the single threat to man's continued dominance on the planet is the virus. Thank you. <laughs> Good. would like to hear from Dr. Bansal first. Um, okay, Mr. How do you pronounce your name? Mr. Maragal. Yes, sir. Siddharun Maragal, sir. Maragal. Yes, sir. I think a wonderful piece of work. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you are a student of you worked at IHR. Can you please clarify what was that kind of connection with IHR? Sir, voice is not audible. One more. Not clear? Not clear. No, you work with let, IHR. Uh, let, yes, sir. let me answer. We have our outreach okay. program. IHR is part of IRI for education okay. purpose. Cool. No, that's so what that, I'm uh, and I'm very happy if that is bearing fruits. This is really good, and um, and I congratulate the the advisor and the student, you know, for doing this good piece of work. And uh, I saw your publication. The methodology was very clear, the way you went along, you know, by identification of some of those species and, you know, pre weeding you made an effort, identified and did all kind of molecular analysis, went to identifying the QTL genes, except that you couldn't go to the fine mapping and some of those candidate genes. And, but finally, you have still identified some, you know, genomic regions with a high degree of phenotypic variance and all. Wonderful. And, um, but with regard to publication, I thought, you know, since you said you reported for the first time, you know, all these uh, could have gone to a better impact factor journals than than what you have, you know, already published. So, what I'm saying is right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Which journal do you think you could have gone for? Frontier Plant Science, sir, and uh, Scientific Reports. And anyway, Frontier Plant Science and Scientific Reports. I I'm not in favor personally. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, nevertheless, and again, in your future course of action, you know, path ahead, you know, you missed out on one point. Do you know about genome editing? Yes, sir. Crystal Castle. Yes, sir. So you think uh, that is possible with the kind of information your, your thesis has generated so much on, you know, identification of some novel alleles, you know, can we use that technology as well? In addition to, you mentioned about, you know, marker assisted selection using the markers you are identifying. Yes, sir, possible, sir. You can go for oh, Can you explain it a little bit? Just don't say yes, possible, not possible. Just explain. Sorry, sir. that one. 
sir actually we have resistance scores na no, sir already on final stage of release means we already identified the resistance lines sir i think these can be go for further and we can release for a variety of programs sir. you can have to speak little slowly though your presentation is very fast but now you do Sir, now, now we have lines within an advanced final stage, sir, with resistance allowing fruit quality traits, sir. Another two generation we can self and we go for directly development of inbred line for a F1 development, sir. Okay. And uh, when was this material registered with NDPJR? It's been 2020, sir. September 2020, sir. 2020, sir. Okay. Okay. I think good. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. The evening hours, you know, I think I will stop here. Good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we can have one question from Dr. Barnwal, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Maragal, uh, very good presentation. But I was just wondering that you did uh, open field screening. And you mentioned that you screen against watermelon bud necrosis virus. But in open field, you encounter several viruses. So how did you ensure that you screen against only this virus, which is thrips transmitted. Sir, we have tested for other viruses also like PRSV, watermelon mosaic virus, Duchenne uh, mosaic virus, and, uh, and uh, GBN. We tried for that. There was a negative result for other viruses, sir. We found only positive for WBN. Okay. So at every stage, did you check in all the experiments? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. If there are no more questions from the other experts, so can we have the comments from the chairperson, sir? <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Zucha. In fact, I could not listen full. I just listened in the beginning and at the end. I'm happy that uh, somebody is working on watermelon. Again, what I said about post harvest technology, the crops which are important to us, which are more important to us and not grown in the Western countries. And I am also happy that... Uh, uh, he has got it registered and material has gone to Gene Bank. Uh, 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 Dr. Marangala, if you are working now also at IHR, are you evaluating some material from Iran? It is not related to your work because Iran is known to have better uh, watermelon than us. So uh, if not, then please try to get that if that is possible. And number two, as mentioned by Dr. Bansal, your train is quite fast. It is difficult to catch your train. Yes, so, yeah. so try to. Very good presentation. Very good. I am very happy that somebody worked on watermelon, produced good piece of work, and very good publications and journal also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So, Chairman, sir, with this, uh, we come to the end of all the uh, 13 presentations which were scheduled for the, uh, today by the phd students so now uh, we'd like to have uh, some although there was a lot of discussion in between and the comments on each presentations were offered by all the expert members but uh, we'd like to have the general comments or the take-home message for the students uh, from the uh, jury members so let us first request members again you can start with dr wansel yeah okay no problems uh, well uh, overall um, the presentations were good. The work carried out was all right. In fact, uh, in, you know, there was, a lot of, I would say, disparity among different disciplines and uh, some disciplines doing excellently well and some disciplines, there's a lot of scope of improvement. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. And again, with regard to the presentations made by the students, no doubt, I must, you know, congratulate them for making an excellent effort for coming up to this stage you know, for competing with the gold medal, uh, it's all very important, very, very, very right. But again, coming back to, you know, um, doing some good quality research, which stands out, you know, while you're doing this work at IRI, the premier institution of Indian agriculture in India, you know, compared to other, you know, in the country or even outside the country for that matter. Uh, because remember, if you go by the mandate of your institute, you are supposed to be doing the frontier area of research and science, you know, so that it gives you those kinds of leads so that you can try to, you know, make a name and place um, anywhere in India and even outside. 
that you stand out and you say, yes, you are from, you know, IRI. And of course, um, those of you who will be getting the gold medal, certainly they would have been just according to their contributions. Nevertheless, all of you have tried. I would say an effort is very important. It has gone deep into it. And um, only thing at times what I wonder, again, and I, I made this point yesterday about different disciplines. For example, even today, post-harvest technology was added to, to vegetables, fruits, floriculture, you know, such disciplines. You know, while it is important, we should have an applied value of all these you know, research what we are doing for, for application at the farmer's level or, or for economic development of the country. But nevertheless, through PhD student research, what we expect is more of basic sciences contribution, actually speaking, asking the questions why and how can we try to, you know, um, answer any certain question in, in science. You know, I can understand at times, probably the discussions would not have gone that deep either with the chairperson or even with the board of studies or, you know, while presenting the ORW before the whole division, you know, or at the deans level, I can understand. But I think it's a student's responsibility to also keep thinking in the whole process that you want to stand out and you want to be the winner, you know, by doing the excellent piece of work, even if you have not been given an opportunity, you must try to be proactive yourself and try to keep thinking about it, keeping in view what the international research direction is at the moment taking place, uh, because this is the only time during your PhD that you can try to contribute, you know, at that high level. Beyond that, you'll be doing, you'll be grabbing projects, you know, we'll have so many other questions, but here, this is an opportunity. I thought students would love to, you know, do more and more work and with regard to keeping pace with international level of science. And though, I don't know, the presentation did not allow the time given to them to give a little bit background, you know, though we were asking questions whether this has been done before or what the literature says, I think uh, kind of next time the presentations could include at least one slide. What is this, what is the, you know, kind of area, current knowledge in, in that area of research, what the student is going to present. So in keeping that as a background, how much more he or she has contributed, not necessarily we always look for some positive good results from the contribution point of view, we can always fail. But still, I think the idea here is to train the students to develop some kind of a, you know, um, reasoning and, and thinking into their minds and how to do proper experiments with proper methodology. All that is very important and will certainly earn you a degree. So you don't have to really worry about all the time positive results, that whether a product or a QTL or a gene or a, or a method of extending shelf life. No, I think you can always try to give your input and if you may or you may not succeed. So I think we have to, at the institute level, my submission to, to the honorable director and to the dean as well, that we have to go beyond, I think the discussion when we do it, um, of these ORW presentations could be gone beyond the particular division, okay, or to the level of schools, or I don't know, earlier when the students were being interviewed for admission and PhD, at IRI, there will be a bench of interview board of about 15 to 20, you know, experts. Can we go back to that kind of a stage of, you know, making presentations? So everybody can try to give an input so that if next time when it's being presented, at least there are no questions asked that why this was not done, why this was lacking, what methodology, et cetera, et cetera. I think that kind of a journey right in the beginning is very, very important to me, it appears, uh, because we have now come off that particular stage further you know, we cannot simply depend on we are not asking questions. I think, you know, IRI has to, again, show the lead and I'm very happy with the collaboration with IR and IHR. I must congratulate the whole institute that other IRI, IARs, IRI is in fact in IHR and other, you know, campus is doing, doing. And this last presentation, I was personally, I, I would say openly, I was most pleased. Though there were others, but I think the kind of direction the student has taken, the guidance and the kind of leads he has given is, is excellent. So with this, um, Chairman, sir, thank you for this opportunity. I thank uh, Professor Dr. Ashok Singh and Madam Team, Dr. Rashmi Agarwal for this opportunity to me. And thank you all my fellow colleagues and fellow jury members and faculty members and HODs and students. Uh, you know, and Professor RM Singh Sahab, my, you know, my you know, regards to him you know, for being present all through and uh, with this opportunity.
Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Can we have a few words from Dr. Patil, sir? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dahuja Sahab. Um, uh, it is indeed a great you know, honor and pleasure for me um, at the outset you know, to be in this committee uh, where you know, Padma Sri uh, Baldev Singh Dilanji has as a chairman. So it, is, it was a wonderful experience and the expert like Dr. Professor Bansal, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Patil, uh, Professor Rakesh Singh from BHU. So a wonderful and a highly competent expert and a lot of learning things, you know, I have, you know, I learned many things from the committee as well as, you know, from the, from the students, in fact. And, and uh, you know, uh, it, is, it was an excellent experience. I know uh, the most exciting program uh, in the convocation uh, of IRI is this program. Uh, the, the students' presentations, MSc and PhD, the most exciting, awaited program. And I always participated when I was at IRI during my student life, as well as staff during, you know, 1999 to 2014. Uh, I, I attended and enjoyed this program. And this time as a member in the jury, you know, earlier, not that attentively, not that seriously, but this time, you know, being a member, so I remained very attentively and try to you know, ask something uh, which is not asked by Professor Bansal because uh, after his you know, interaction, <laughs> any scope to you know, further you know, ask. So in my way, I asked, uh, you know, this time as a member of the jury, uh, so more keenly, more attentively, I uh, tried, you know. And I learned a lot uh, and enlightened very much uh, Heartiest congratulations you know, to all the participants. In fact, uh, the students uh, who uh, participated, presented so excellently, everybody deserves the, you know, the best, uh, as a best, you know, the gold medal of IRA, everyone. Um, and, but since the, there are limitations uh, to the winners, who will be the winners to them, heartiest congratulations in advance, and who are not you know, missed maybe narrowly, very, very narrowly to them also, because everybody winners, uh, your work is very much, you know, now known to the big uh, audience, more than, you know, 800 audience participants and you also nice presentation. So you have done wonderful, I should say. And I know my students also got gold medals and um, Jawaharlal Nehru awards. So the, the pains for that, you know, how much, you know, even with the, with the chairman and, the, and the, with the members, a lot of practices, you know, the students do uh, and narrowly, narrowly they compete. Uh, so they learned a lot in this practice and they, they are, uh, in fact, they signed by doing um, so much of uh, practices. So everyone is the winner and um, to each of them, you know, hearty congratulations and keep it up. The, the efforts you made this time, every time, you show your best, you know, and you are going to win and here or there. So many gold medals, everyone, so many awards they got. So this, please sustain this, you know, excellence. And uh, IRA is known for its excellence in science, in education, and this is the hallmark of IRA. It is so exciting, so exciting to learn mm -hmm. new things. And <coughs> it also shows the scope, the scope of work, you know, every field, the enormous scope, it is, you know, not that it is very limited in every field, whether it is nitrogen research, which was going before 50 years, and now also there are huge scopes. So in a team spirit uh, and um, new science, the frontier science, a uh, lot of opportunities are there. So only, you know, my, uh, as an encouragement to all the students um, who participated and who will be participating maybe next year and next year, Please do your, you know, the best. You have, you have the best. You are at the best place. You got the best expertise, and the best uh, faculty, and um, this is the, you know, the place, uh, uh, the place of excellence. And you got the opportunities. So I am really thankful to honourable director, Dr. Ek Singh Saab, the member, uh, all the members, and the, the dean, uh, uh, Dr. Rasmi Agrawal, uh, all the jury members, all the head of the divisions, professor of IRI 
uh, I know, I know most of you, and um, uh, this was an opportunity. And also, I'm so happy uh, to see Professor Rishimuni Singhji, and you are here. It was really wonderful, sir, to see you. And you taught genetics, and still I remember my notes were there still the other day, and I have given to the, the students those notes. So it was really there are so many you know luminaries and the outstanding achievers here, and uh, wherever you know my you know my heart and mind and soul always in a, at IRI though I am here at Bhopal, but you know my you know 20 years I spent at IRI. So it was really a wonderful experience. And thank you, Professor A.K. Singh, Director of IRI. And it was really, perhaps you thought about me, and I got this opportunity. So not taking much time, all the very best to all of you. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. So now I would like to request Dr. Patil for his remarks and the overall experience. OK, thank you, Dhavajaji. Uh, uh, actually, I feel uh, very proud and uh, privileged to be associated with this uh, opportunity given by the director and vice chancellor IARI, Dr. A.K. Singhji. And uh, it was a really a unique experience to listen to young researchers, MSc and PhD, for their merit medals, as well as the Nabard Vale Chopra Gold Medal, Best Student of the Year Award. <clears throat> In all, actually, two days, really, almost 34 uh, presentations we could listen. And actually, it was a cream, actually. And uh, we cannot say number one or number two. I think everybody is number one. And uh, as you know that I am a sitting vice chancellor. So it is very difficult to spare a time. But the, the started yesterday, I was a little bit uh, But I uh, really enjoyed uh, all whole uh, yesterday as well as today. And uh, knowledge acquired by me during these presentations Actually, I, I am actually enlightened because I am I am listening to all these speakers about IRI, IRI. I am not the IRI uh, graduate. Uh, I have done my B.Tech from Rahuri and M.Tech from IIT Kadak for being engineering background. And uh, many things, I have learned many things from the uh, so many disciplines. Uh, only from agricultural engineering side, I think there are very few presentations only post harvest technology in phd and uh, ms i think no presentations but uh, all, all the other subjects i could uh, uh, gather a lot of information uh, some general comment actually uh, the powerpoint presentations actually they were very very colorful full of uh, uh, many <coughs> uh, things and too much text is loaded in this uh, so i think uh, you should be a little bit uh, in future uh, if you guide the students, because it is very difficult to get so many uh, material in one slide. And actually, again, one more general uh, suggestion is that interdisciplinary approach actually should be increased in research. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, we're all, and we have given some comments, suggestions. It is not actually critic. It is just for the improvement of the some presentations. And uh, you know that, and uh, one more thing, technology and science, our ultimate aim is to reach the farmer or industry uh, so that uh, overall masses will be uh, benefited. I think uh, 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 actually, uh, I think um, I extend my congratulations to all of uh, all the students. Uh, some may be get the awards, some may not get the awards, some will fail. But I think failure is not the opposite of the success. It is a part of success that they should keep in mind and try and try for getting success in future. With these words, once again, I am grateful to the IRI director, uh, Dr. A.K. Singhji, as well as the uh, uh, very learned Padmasri uh, Baldev Singh Dillon and uh, our uh, Bansal Saab, Joshi Saab, Patra Saab, I think uh, we enjoyed, I personally enjoyed a lot in this. Once again, uh, thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Now we'd like to have a few words from Professor Rakesh Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dauja. And uh, good evening, Shadar Namaste. Uh, at the outset, uh, 
I extend my gratitude to respected Dr. A.K. Singh Ji, Director IARI, and his team, Dr. Asmi Agrawal, Dr. Manjaya, Dr. Anil Dahuja, for giving this opportunity to be part of uh, this program. Really, it is an honor for me to be part of a committee which is chaired by Dr. Honorable Dr. Dhillan Sir. My regards to him. My regards to Dr. Banamsal Sir, Dr. Patil Sir, as well as Dr. Patra Sir, who are the uh, respected jury members. My regards to uh, Honorable Professor Rishi Muni Singh Sir, who is guardian or local guardian at VHU. And my regards to all my colleagues, senior colleagues. Really, uh, I inspired and uh, these two days was very much interesting and uh, I could get so many knowledge through the discussion and through the presentation. Only one uh, submission I would like to convey that through the discussion and presentation, uh, one thing was, I think it was conveyed to the students, researcher, that uh, the main stakeholder is the key person, which should be the focal point of research, whether it is the farmer, whether, whether it is consumer, ultimately the research should benefit to the society. And therefore, in most of the presentation, it was emphasized that how it will, this technology will be commercialized, how the consumers will be benefited, what, we, what is the economic analysis, what is the economics and so on and so on. So I'm confident that uh, in future, the researcher will also take care of this. And once again, I'm thankful to each one of you and the uh, honorable chairman, as well as, as well as the director, IARI, Dr. A.K. Singh sir. Thank you, sir. So we are very <coughs> fortunate that uh, we are having Dr. R Aram Singh uh, with us. So he have been uh, patient listening all the presentations. So we'd uh, like to hear from uh, you, sir, and uh, Dr. Aram Singh, please. Very good evening to esteemed chairperson of the program and the jury members. It has been a great opportunity for me to learn from the young budding scientists. My hearty congratulations to all of them for very nice presentation spanning across the disciplines and that has been really a very remarkable uh, feat for me uh, as pro older uh, we would like to really learn something from these younger people and that has really been fulfilled uh, today uh, by general observation uh, in this uh, uh, presentation which I could see uh, uh, was that uh, it is the uh, interaction between the student and the guide. This is very, very critical and very important. Uh, unless the guide and the student both discuss the search problem thoroughly and guide makes it sure. This is my impression that guide makes it sure that there is going to be some new innovation, new input of the research. Because this is the PhD problem. I am particularly, I'm restricting myself to PhD, which where you can spend more time, there is no time, you can go for four, five, six years for doing this thing, but you must come out with some new innovation to the science. This must be uh, a, a priority, which I find in presentations, uh, in, except few, this was uh, not so. I mean, the presentations were there, the results were there, 
but what was new in that if you take for example uh, conservation agriculture for example i was rrct uh, to uh, general term now if you have some problem on this we know that uh, it takes very long time i mean there could be at some places fields where uh, this has been going on for a pretty long period but if somebody wants to do it uh, over a short period of time the second pillar of this thing is that you must have a, a very good crop cover over the period to get the result out of the rct r thing and if that is not there then you are not going to get any result from it so uh, this is just one observation in general so the problem must be thoroughly discussed and the student and guide must uh, discuss this thing over and over again this problem of the student also that must review the entire literature available on the topic uh, because i know that in uh, other uh, countries when you go for doing research the first the student had to do the research in a way of consulting library and reviewing the area in which one is interested because the guide cannot uh, really force a student to take a particular problem to do the research on it it is the student research because in many cases i have seen that uh, i i was giving some of my students uh, on wheat but the other fellow says that no i am interested it's because rice is more important for my state so these things uh, you know a priority uh, and i have seen i uh, there uh, were about 35 students who have done phd with me on various aspects in my a career as a teacher and researcher here at banaras hindu university and uh, uh, the, there has to be a very uh, uh, um, uh, uh, very compatible kind of a interaction between the two the the student and the guide so these uh, are my some observations uh, general observations uh, uh, but uh, nonetheless this has been a uh, nice um, uh, event uh, for two days i have been listening uh, to most of the presentations uh, and uh, i have learned a lot uh, uh, thanks uh, a lot for providing me this opportunity to dr ak singh director pri and also the chair uh, uh, professor vs dillon who has been a good friend of mine when i was in ludhiana last time i visited his place and as uh, his uh, you know very good uh, uh, interaction with him uh, my student sujay rakshit is a director uh, uh, at uh, ludhiana uh, and this is one good thing for a teacher satisfying thing for a teacher that many of my students like uh, gyanendra at uh, uh, at karnal Uh, sujay rakshit at uh, ludhiana uh, and many others at um, iri uh, uh, have been uh, um, doing so uh, excellent in their endeavors which is most greeting five for a teacher whenever i go somewhere i find one or the other student coming and touching the feet this is the you know greatest uh, this thing you can I have satisfaction in life being a teacher so thank you thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, uh, the uh, organizer uh, thank you very much thank you thank you sir for hearing your experiences and giving the suggestions about the mentor mentee relationships uh, a very pertinent one sir so now i would like to uh, request the chairperson of the session uh, dr p s dillon sir uh, for his final remarks thank you dr dhusha <coughs> thank you very much <coughs> dear colleague uh, you remember sir dr bansal saab dr patel saab dr patra saab dr k singh dr joshi 
he has not concluded. Dr. A.K. Singh, Dr. Rashmi Agarwal, Dr. R.M. Singh Ji, Dr. Gaur, he should be there. And Dr. Brood, I would like to acknowledge him also. He was there yesterday. Faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I have, first of all, I will say that I am thankful, I feel privileged, I feel honored that I have been given this duty. Thanks to authorities of IRI. It is an enlightening experience for me, a learning experience. IER is a premier institution. Yeah, we do compete with each other, but we complement also. And uh, moreover, it's my alma mater. And uh, that way, it's always player, honor. And I don't have, a, as I was saying earlier, that we are not uh, devtas. I have one bad habit that uh, I give the comments in between. So you will have to be here with me. I will be repeating most of the things. First of all, I think before uh, thanking others, I must thank my colleagues, the jury members, and on the I have been learning, working with you since 1999 or 1998. I joined ICR in 98, and I think. We came in touch with each other in 1999 or 98. Your critical nature, always trying to give suggestion for improvement. Because finding the gap, doing critical analysis, then telling also, seeing that, that helps. That, oh, here is our weakness, or here is a point where we can make progress. And similar thing with the Dr. Patel. Dr. Patra Saab and Dr. Rikhe Singh. Economics is uh, something like this that uh, our generation, I, I belong to a little bit elder generation. And variety adaptation are so good. And I, I'm plant breeder. So we all the time thought that whatever variety we gave in maize from PAU, it got accepted. Of course, acceptance was not as fast or as wide as rice or wheat. So we used to feel extension is not important. It's all technological-led progress. But slowly and slowly, as we had wider experience, then came to knowledge, no, no, it is not only technology, it has to be policy also, it has to be extension also. Just take example of rice wheat in Punjab. It is now... In addition to technology, it was policy procurement. It is policy free electricity supply. And extension, Punjab farmers accept uh, new technology like uh, varieties or pesticide application or fertilizers also very rapidly. But whenever you talk about conservation technology, they, they don't listen because for them, livelihood is very, very important. So extension is important. Social sensor are important. And uh, seeing that uh, we started uh, a center of PAU in marketing research that is located at Mahali about uh, one year back when I was still on the job. So all these things, uh, now my one request, I, I, my jumbled one, my request to uh, faculty that uh, Normally, we should focus on the sciences for betterment of the society. We create new information, thinking it, it may be good, it will be good, sometimes it may not be good. That, that also happens. But still, when the student comes up for such presentations, just discuss with him or her economic uh, considerations. That's just a natural question for an economist or for an all-rounder like me to ask that what are the implications if we are working on some applied technology, if we are working on science, typical science, uh, which have been emphasized, and that, 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 that should be important in PhD research. MSc, we may not expect much, but a PhD student from IERE again, 
may not be from all the places. Dr. Patel, sorry. <laughs> Whenever I say other places, I mean mostly PAU. Uh, I don't, uh, I, other genius I feel better than PAU. So sense is very, very important, but as I, I think stated yesterday that I could not get money from Chief Minister of Punjab for PAU by showing the publications. Ultimately, so we are in a dichotomy, agriculture research. In fact, uh, I think this Saturday, there was a presentation by Dr. T. Ramaswamy, former uh, secretary, DST, who gave this in spare person, et cetera, et cetera. He started. Wonderful person. And fact from them, publications or technology. And then he agreed that agriculture is different. I will not again repeat that I wrote a paper in current sense if someone is interested. We are in a dichotomy. We have to keep a balance, as I stated in the morning, balance between sensitivity and stability of physical balance. Similarly, germplasm screening on large scale and keeping other factors constant. So these things, object, uh, etc. So that way, but on the whole, I will say research. I am very happy with the research projects selection. All are very, very relevant. Maybe of media. For example, post harvest technology. I will say for Punjab agriculture, that's now more important than biotechnology. What, what, what is the avenue? Processing, value addition, and export. What else? Because our stores are already overflowing. And what biotechnology? can do. We can have more genes, better self-life, etc., etc. Everything can be done. But at the same time, such sciences which don't look that, that much scientific or traditional plant building our times. Very good uh, research project, very good planning of the program. But somehow, sometimes, everything cannot be done in within three, four, five years. But some innovation should be there or some application should be there. As Honorable uh, Dr. R.M. Singh said that there should be something out of uh, uh, PhD. I will just share uh, with uh, you all that I spent four, year, four years and three months to finish my PhD. My colleagues at all, my colleagues have gone, except for one gentleman was there, I will not name him. Uh, he was there. He, he took more time than me. And we, from PhD, we really expect much more than MSc. Then we use extreme words. During my first day in Germany, my professor was on the board of Saitrufnanya uh, system, which later on became plant breeding. He one day asked me, Dr. Tillon, why Indians use two extreme words? Like some paper is on path coefficient analysis or on combinability. He says that only this thing is going to be this. It is savior of uh, 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 plant breeding, or this route should be followed. We have certain problems. We have certain things need to be done. But let us uh, don't use extreme words. Balance words. I had a problem not only with Punjab government, even with the no report. Growth rate of Punjab is very bad, uh, very poor. That problem of growth rate started from there. And ultimately, that paper again, economists didn't, Dr. Kaysen, economists didn't agree to publish that paper. Then we published in Punjab Agriculture University Journal. Same thing as with the data which we, because there are certain fixed ideas in every sense, fixed things in the mind. Without base in a biological system, without base, we cannot talk about. In fact, Dr. Kaysen, recently, I don't know whether they will publish or not, I wrote a note for newspapers. I gave the title Attention Agriculture Economists. Western economy is different. Then I sent to an economist friend that I said, please update it. He changed the title. That title is much more. Uh, so <laughs> that way, we, we, economist, economy ultimately, it is going to be economy. It is going to be livelihood of the farmers. Anyway, so uh, then about field experiment at Sadli, Sadli also. For me, one location, one year data doesn't have any meaning, whether it is MSC thesis, if in 1967 68, I as a MSc student of plant, we don't have two year data. Why can't we have two location data 
if not two years later. And Karnal is just nearby. Karnal has different ecology because uh, here is now uh, just uh, all around we have urban population. Microclimate entirely different. Or PAU, you can come. Or I used to go to Pantanagar or uh, Merit University nearby. That is a new thing. But I will not force anything. Then uh, <coughs> Dr. Aram Singh, very, uh, I will say, very pertinent point review of the teacher. At our time, review of the teacher was very, very important. Dr. Dhuja, I have to be fast. In fact, I'm just repeating all the things. If you're getting late. It's okay, sir. Sir, please. It's okay. It's Sorry, okay. Please. Because you asked me to, again, then I have to uh, yes. go. At our times, uh, it usually completely with the teacher. If you see before crop science started, even crop science also, earlier crop science, agronomy general, complete new with the teacher. Now we don't know that as uh, one click uh, present to make the presentation that a policy has started from 1970s. No, it started from 1960s. That is very, very important. Then Dr. R. M. Singh Ji also touched a little bit about uh, research problem. My experience in staying in Western countries is that they are not better than us. They are not more hardworking than We are more hardworking than them. Only difference in our education, no spoon feedings there outside. They just let the student, you do your work. You find whatever you want to do. That way the student develops. Here we have certain parameters and those are limitation of our system, not limitation of teacher A, B or C. As I was in maize breeding, I will like my student to work in maize breeding. There is no such limitation there in that case. Oh, first professor is from, let us say, maize breeding. Next professor when he retired, next comes from evolution. Third one comes from seed science. So the student work different areas, but we are different limitation of our system. We have to go with them. Then one suggestion which I gave yesterday about faculty, Dr. Bansu gave a moved ahead. So maybe institute can, because suggestion given, given suggestion is very, very easy. Dr. A.K. Singh and Dr. Rashmi, please don't worry about suggestion. Even if you take one step, that is progress. Socrates said, if you want to solve all problem, you will solve none. Solve the problem one by one. It is something like this. I 100% it may not be same. Another suggestion which has come to my mind that uh, if you remember, I was giving more suggestions yesterday to the, I was keeping quiet because I what I said yesterday, I didn't want to say again and again. If possible, number one, have PhD uh, presentation on the first day because we have more expectations from PhD and with more scope for improvement. And second step, if possible, can we have subject-wise publication, first PhD, then MSc, first P then first agriculture, uh, economics, and then then genetics, whatever, alphabetically, that's very good. So that we don't, things are common. If it's some uh, post the technology, the, 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 the jury members are going to ask economic implications. If it is agricultural biotechnology, then uh, we are going to ask about publications. I, I don't know if this is workable, but having PhD first may be easier. And having a little bit of time for as Dr. what Dr. Mansing mentioned is very pertinent. Little bit of time for interaction difficulty, maybe two minutes, three minutes. Then at this presentation I said earlier also, too much data are there. I don't know how uh, our dear student uh, and dear student that happened with us also. Whatever we did, we want to show everything to the faculty. When I was a, a, appeared for one of the interviews, uh, very high level interviews, they asked to give presentation in five minutes. I just finished four or five slides and then they said, okay, enough, it is enough, it's enough. But you have to doubt that it is a presentation is an art. Your work also an art also. Then too many things, this uh, light coming from here and there, they, we are distracted. Whatever time we have, we cannot focus on that. So simplified, use different colors or whatever you want to. Uh, I told the rule is six by six, but nobody is following that, and that cannot be followed. Then, uh, then about the students again, participation is very, very important. There cannot be any winner. Somebody has to 
some people five or six six will get the gold medal but others should not feel that oh they have lost no there's no failure participation is very very important other the colleagues could get the gold medal because you participated so feel happy that you have been selected by the division level you made presentation good presentation i will not hesitate to say that probably you all of you will deserve gold medal compare with the other university and you will see that uh, the level your level is higher than at other places so please uh, don't feel disheartened and faculty uh, take in any other way our objective is positive input and when we give input it has to be critical we cannot all the same time say very good very good on the other side i am saying please use balanced uh, uh, <coughs> language not the extreme that mare gaye lutte gaye poison kha rahe hain pata nahi kya ho gaya ye ho gaya punjab ki soil mein organic matter nahi hai kahin bhi soil health yeah soil health is down there are certain factors but not that and if we are harvesting nearly 12 tons per year then we have to buy fertilizers if i want to run fast i need uh, some milk and some ghee also so take let us take holistic view when we criticize ourselves but same thing when we talk with outside our home those are used against us you will face when you come when you occupy the positions of head administration head administration we have to have a balance if we start criticizing ourselves then we cannot raise funds not that uh, we have done bad no, food is first requirement atom bomb will come later on satellite will come later on if you have enough food and uh, you are alive other things will come later on so thanks to faculty and most of our suggestion uh, dear participants who are making presentation they are more applicable to the students your colleagues who are going to follow or uh, and to the faculty rather than what you have done you have done you have got phd we are not finding fault our session how to do still better and we have to do better otherwise no otherwise there is a no 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 possibility of making progress as in one case there was no control we have to have whatever is prevalent in the at the moment any check check has to be there in every study otherwise no things will not work so that's all i will go on repeating what i said yesterday in the morning throughout so better i should uh, stop over here i was trying to remember one thing which i have forgotten uh, give me half a minute if i can it is a book uh, by ka bureaucracy gets crazier from that uh, there is one quote uh, i am remember one there, there are two quotes so anyway to make the things uh, lighter whatever i remember i will tell you he writes that the best uh, mind goes to engineering he, he gives the use uses that term, engineering he doesn't talk about agriculture scientist <clears throat> he doesn't talk about medical science and next best go to uh, services ies ips etc et et and next best who are left they become politician and those who cannot even become politicians they become patrka dr damodaran sir please if you are here please don't listen to me it is written from the book i am not the author of that book uh, sekti Union government secretary Ka, he is the author, and he says that pity is that uh, the engineer reports to bureaucrat, bureaucrat to politician, and politician fears only journalist. That is our society, and we have work, we have to work in that, and we have to make progress. Other something I wanted to tell, it is not coming to my mind just now. So thank you very much. Learning experience, it is enlightening experience for me. I feel honored. Thanks to Dr. A K Singh. thanks to dr rashmi and i will say thanks to dr dhuja and barman also they they managed the things in a wonderful manner aur dr dhuja sahab aapki english bahut achhi hai agar meri itni english badhiya aur smooth hoti to main pata nahi kya aur kar deta 
आई एम फ्रॉम एपर स्कूल इंग्लिश का टीचर जो कहते हैं जी कह दो दा कह दो कोई अंतर ही नहीं है जो मर्जी करो जी लगाना है नहीं लगाओ आई गॉट वंडरफुल सर्टिफिकेट फ्रॉम माई फर्स्ट प्रोफेसर इन जर्मनी बट ही मैंशन दैट ही डजन नो हाउ टू यूज आर्टिकल देर देर वंडरफुल पर्सन आउटसाइड दे राइट वट एवर दे फील सो वेरी गुड इंग्लिश थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू इट्स प्लेयर टू इंटरेक्ट एंड लर्न समथिंग एंड नो सम न्यू पर्सन थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच now we would like to have few words from honorable director sir thank you dr dauja for giving me this opportunity uh, i would like to extend uh, my gratitude to all the jury members uh, dr bansal dr patil dr patra dr joshi dr akesh singh and the chairperson of the session dr dilan uh as a matter of fact this uh, particular uh, you know uh, significant uh, research finding presentation by the student has been very very interactive this is one thing i noticed last year also it was chaired by dr jan but this time i found that the quality of interaction between the jury members and the students the confidence that was shown by the students in replying to the answers uh, questions of the uh, jury members Uh, that was remarkable and uh, at no point of time i felt that uh, they were uh, you know uh, not confident of what they have done and as a matter of fact when yesterday uh, uh, this decision came uh, i was about to say that the day examination uh, happens or a presentation of this kind happens in fact the students should be uh, better equipped than his or her a uh, guide on that particular day particularly that that's the kind of things you have done the work and you have come with the full uh, preparation so i am very thankful to dr dilun for steering the entire proceedings so well uh, which is uh, i have had of course uh, association with him for uh, decades and when we used to work together on a paper on heterotic pools that he mentioned the other day and genetic basis of heterosis Uh, he was so critical many times when we did not uh, agree on a particular uh, you know issues he will say let us uh, agree to disagree if we don't agree so i don't i never forget the quote that he he said and a very encouraging one thing uh, it's so unique about him is that uh, whatever he feels he he tells and he never keeps it uh, you know uh, that uh, um if, even if it is something that uh, he feels that you may not like but he don't hesitate to tell that but he will not keep it in his mind so he is uh, just like a normal person after he has said that so that's a unique uh, quality to acquire and learn i am uh, thankful to uh, uh, dr bansal has been you know thanks a lot uh, he has been so interactive in almost all presentation all experts dr patra dr patil Uh, dr akesh singh input came uh, very well and uh, it it requires a lot of efforts to listen to the presentation carefully because i know uh, all the experts uh, would not have a specialization in all the subject and when you have to interact uh, you are not interacting just for sake of interacting you are uh, asking a question that makes some sense uh, because if you are asking a question which doesn't make sense then the student also go with a feeling and then when they go out of it they start talking about it that the question quality and these things interact but that's not the case we have seen very positive feedback in the chat box from the students from the faculty from everybody uh, i am thankful to uh, professor rm singh uh, uh, for me uh, more than my real brother he is a great teacher and i always uh, remember many times when i Uh, uh you know he used to teach mitosis meiosis in bsc agriculture classes and when i uh, one day i remember still i was going to write my examination and about to get out of house he called me and he said have you prepared everything well i said yes then he gave me you know uh, a, a a problem that if 2 year is equal to 10 uh, in a particular uh, say species like uh, maize 2 uh, uh, year is equal to 20 and it's equal to 10 draw the diagram of uh, say metaphase 2 before going the examination 
So, so that was the kind of uh, rigor that he used to subject. And if you don't know that, you know, and if you have that kind of clarity, probably you will never, uh, uh, that helps a lot in understanding the subject. And uh, I'm thankful to all the faculty members, the students for being in very large number and very active during the entire presentation. Uh, thanks once again. And uh, let us hope that uh, we are able to identify the best of the best uh, candidates for these uh, six plus six uh, medal, which are very, very prestigious. Thank you very much. This year, since we are starting uh, Professor VL Chopra Nabard medal, which is uh, a very prestigious one, it will go to the best student of the year for MSc and also for PhD. And uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Sintala, the uh, chairman Nabard, who happens to be IRI alumni for coming forward to sponsor this uh, uh, medal. So really we are thankful to Nabard for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So uh, th with this, uh, we come to the uh, end of this function, but before we actually close, so I would uh, like to acknowledge the efforts of all those who are actually involved in the successful organization of this program. So <clears throat> it's my proud privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks on this occasion, sir. So at the outset, a big round of applause for all the 35 presenters and the MSc and PhD category for making excellent presentations. Uh, it really made our day, sir. Uh, it is indeed praiseworthy that despite the pandemic situation, they could finish the committed objectives of their work and publish their findings in reputed journals as well. And kudos to their chairpersons as well. So although only 12 of you will be going home with medals, but I must say that the experience of presenting your findings in front of stalwarts we had in our judging panel, it is simply priceless and unmatchable. And it is indeed a rare opportunity to have them all on a single platform. So here I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude to the chairperson of this session, Dr. B.S. Dhilno, sir, for his unrestrained, candid and all-round comments and also for his words of wisdom. Sir, we all have been enriched and benefited through your wealth of knowledge and practical experience. My thanks are also due to the members of the judging committee, Dr. Casey Bansal, Dr. A.K. Joshi, uh, who is not present today, and Dr. P.J. Patil, Dr. A.K. Patra, and Professor Rakesh Singh for sparing your precious time and having constructive interactions with all the presenters. I'm sure it will motivate and encourage them immensely to be candid, I was personally awestruck uh, by a scientific acumen, comprehensive knowledge and energy level of you all. Not to mention your never dying zeal to learn still more in diverse subjects from the distinct sources. So I would also like to profusely thank Dr. A.K. Singh, sir, Director IRI, for being the pillar of strength for all of us and also for providing his constant help, support, guidance, encouragement during the organization of this program. I'm thankful, sir that uh, uh, you could be with us for, for uh, two full days despite your busy schedule and other pressing commitments. My deepest regards and thanks to uh, Dean and Joint Director of Education, Dr. Rashmi, uh, Rashmi Agarwal, ma'am, uh, who is the major driving force for all of us involved in the convocation related activities. Ma'am, your deep sense of involvement with uh, the team members is indeed infectious. No words are enough to thank Dr. Manjaya, Associate Dean, uh, for his dedicated, selfless, and untiring efforts for the successful organization of this program. Sir, your calm and cool demeanor under intense pressure of deadlines is really encouraging and motivating. My heartfelt thanks are also due to Dr. Berman, Dr. Amrinder Jha, and his team, and Dr. Robin Gogoi and his team of PG students, Ms. Deepthi and Ms. Simardeep Kaur, to name a few. I must say that without your support, it would not have been possible to conduct this session so efficiently and effectively. I also convey my thanks to all the directors of the sister institutes and outreach centers of IRI, other invited guests, PDs, HODs, professors, faculty members, and students for their presence and active participation in this program. My special thanks are also due to all the staff members of the postgraduate school who worked shoulder to shoulder as a perfect team in the background.
I personally uh, have been educated immensely through my involvement in this session as uh, a convener. I thank the competent authority of this institute for entrusting me with this responsibility. In the end, let me once again reiterate